What's up, everybody? How's it going? How's it going, everybody? It's good to see you. Yo, Laffy in chat? Let's go. Spider emoji? I love that guy. Yeah, Laffy's awesome, man. I love Laffy. He's such a good dude. Always always just the life of the party. Always a good, a good man to talk to and stuff like that. It cracks me up, too, with just all the awesome cat videos and stuff like that. Like, always makes my day. Um, I see a lot of people, Stu Peters in chat, trying to start an and n-word tower you know you love to see it man you guys crack me up you, you crack me up to say the least um i love you too sir but i don't like spiders no i i feel you dude i don't like spiders either um i don't know why you put a spider emoji in chat but you know hey that's okay you know that that's my name on the street spider that's my the, my russian mob name right spider you know that's what the that's what the uh Russian mobsters call me, but you know, shh, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> Let's go, dude. Uh, Zizu, uh, Z uh, how do you pronounce that? Uh, Zizu, Zizu reporting, and Let's go, dude. Bro, uh, that nun you post, nun vid you posted recently went crazy. Oh, the nun in the video, um, went crazy. That's horrible. If she went crazy, I, I. I certainly hope that's not the case uh if so let let's keep her in our prayers and stuff like that zizo okay zizo let's go z so z so z so let's go man i'm horrible at uh at uh uh mentioning other names mm. no i mean it went crazy good oh yeah, yeah yeah for sure okay that's awesome i i thought it was bad I thought you were saying that she she went crazy recently. I'm like, that's horrible, man. But no, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, such just such a beautiful uh, heart for God and stuff like that. Like, I I can just tell that she really uh, uh, loves Jesus with all her heart and stuff like that. And it's always beautiful to see just just the profound um, love that a nun has for Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, uh, Mother Angelica was a huge influence on me. Uh, still is she's a huge influence in my life and just her love and the way that she expresses it you know saint catherine of siena saint mother cabrini and those are uh, only a few nuns who have had a massive impact in my life so gl glory be to jesus christ man that's awesome um let's see here pine sap what's the validity of aladdin venerating nicholas the second 
Uh, you cannot venerate Tsar Nicholas II. He was a schismatic, and he and he did persecute the church. Um, there's no validity in venerating him. Uh, he most certainly would would be uh, schismatic, and so you can't venerate Tsar Nicholas II in any way, shape, or form. Uh, he was not in communion with the Catholic Church, uh, and actively persecuted the church as well. Hmm. It's a stupid reference to Life Aquatic. No, I I know where the um. Uh, I know where the reference is from uh, the Wes Anderson movie, right? Um, you know, I I, I think uh, uh, <laughs> the I I'm sorry, I'm laughing at a comment that someone someone left. Um, uh, yeah, Life Aquatic's a good movie. I need to rewatch that, dude. Life Aquatic's a solid movie. Um, but don't Eastern Catholics venerate him, or are you wrong? No, uh, they do not officially commemorate him. If someone, if an individual Eastern Catholic was to commemorate him, they would be doing it contrary to the wishes of the church. Um, so that's, uh, th th there's no validity um, in, in venerating him. Um, three said, can you say happy birthday for my friend? I know what you're trying to do, bro. He's saying, can you say happy birthday for my friend Z and then dot, 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 Kyle. Yeah, I, I, I wonder I wonder what he's trying to get. I wonder what my boy in chat's trying to get me to say, man. I, I wonder what he's trying to get me to say. Hmm. <laughs> Dude, let's go. Um, Let's see. Is it true that Emperor Constantine sympathized with Arianism? No. He was baptized by uh, Eusebius, I believe. Um, but no, he, there's no evidence that he, he, uh, he, he was a, uh, admirer of Arianism. I mean, he literally convoked the council of Nicaea and punished Arians, bro. Like he was not a, you know, he was not someone who sympathized with Arianism. And even though he was baptized by an Arian at the time that he was baptized, it would not be, uh, it would not be like a baptism that, um, how do I explain this? The sacrament of baptism that that Arian bestowed upon him would have been valid because I think that Arian at the time was still technically in communion with the church, if I'm not mistaken. Could he, uh, could Nicholas II still be, um, uh, held as a martyr? No, he, he could not cause he was not martyred for the faith. When sap commentary on Talmud video dropping. So I'm okay with looking at that today. I, 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 so just, just to give you guys kind of a, a little image into my mind, the reason I've been doing so many hangout streams and kind of more casual stuff is when I like to do big stuff, I get almost like perfection paralysis where it's like, if I can't execute it perfectly, I don't like to do it like half-hearted. I, I, I don't like to do things half-hearted. So, you know, I, I think doing a cold reaction to Lofton's video seems a little, uh, a little tough for me, but you know, heck, why not? We'll do it. Um, I think I'm pretty sure I have, um, I'm pretty sure I have, uh, 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 Peter Schaefer's book on my computer. And if not, I could, I could just download it. Um, it, it would not be a problem. Bye bye pirate. <laughs> it's shh. bye bye. You know, the, the, <laughs> the mewing video, actually, maybe I should play, maybe I should play that video, uh, real quick. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Shlomo Rabinowitz. That's so over, dude. Why is someone named that? Um, let's see here. And then it's just like the mewing, like the, <laughs> the, the, the view where it's like, you know, just straw jog line, jog line and stuff like that. <laughs> bye bye. And then just, you know, you see like Trump, you see like the cat that's got like, uh, you know, the jawline from the bee sting and stuff like that. What is it? Dude, I'm not answering. I'm not answering all your fed questions, man the the guy who's like three i chat i'm not answering all the fed questions man um let's see here 
mewing moment. Dude, so true. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Also, we should pull up Lofton's video on the Talmud. <laughs> Rock mewing. Uh, Michael Lofton. Bye-bye. Let's see here. Let me just make sure I also have the. Book, I sure do. Let me just open it in the um, in Brave. There we go. There we go, buddy. Let's see here. <laughs> Let's see. Yes or no, dude? I'm not answering that question, bro. Sorry, you're gonna you're gonna get a silent answer on that. Recently saw Greece legalize gay marriage, Orthodox L. Well, J. Cole, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have shot in Freud for that, man. That's disgusting and horrible and sad, and we should pray that that gets overturned and stuff like that. Um, it's not good when that happens anywhere. So. I, I totally get what you're saying and stuff like that. I mean, yes, you know, the ortho bros like to chest pump and they're like, you know, none of none of the degeneracy of the West happens in an orthodox country, which is just not true. But that being said, we shouldn't have schadenfreude um, towards the Eastern Orthodox by any means. Um, because whenever that happens anywhere, it's sad. You know, wherever wherever that happens anywhere, it's it's sad and it's horrible. You know what I mean? So, little flower enjoyer laughing. Little flower enjoyer cackling right now, bro. Okay, so we're going to watch the... Uh, let me probably speed up the video because I'm sure it's... We go to... Put it at 720. Put it at, like, 125. He has none of the humility of Aquinas. <laughs> yeah, I don't think... I don't think calling Michael Lofton Thomas Aquinas is really... Uh, really good someone pull up into his house and leave stains on his shirt for that dang man what the boy doing bro oh also um just so you guys know i think i got the power chat live fixed if you would like to donate again you don't have to by any means you're not required to um but if you would like to donate i heavily appreciate any donations that uh that you give and stuff like that. Still trying to save up for the religious liberty book because it's uh it's the R. Michael Dunnigan book's pretty expensive. It's like fifty bucks, so I'm still trying to save up for that. Uh, I have it at seventy because Square takes a percentage of like your uh, whatever donations you make or whatever. But if you guys would like to submit super chats, I got that working. Powerchat.live slash pinesap three. Um, but you don't need to by any means. Um. Does the text to speech work? I need to talk to uh, Chief about getting text to speech working. That would be really cool. I, I need to talk to Chief Trumpster about that. I, I know he could help me with that. What's your reading, Pine Sap? Uh, so I'm still reading St. Francis of Assisi's biography. Still trying to make my way through Secret of the Rosary. I, I've I've kind of uh, I've kind of slumped back on reading recently. I need to get back into it. Um, but yeah, I, I was reading a little bit about uh, St. Francis and his world, or Francis in, of Assisi and his world by. Uh, mark galley i always forget his name mark galley the other day and it's a beautiful book it's been very inspiring to me um i'll donate to you if i control you with the tts well i well i don't have text to speech whatever you do type will appear on on screen so you can still get some good laughs in um it just doesn't have i, I just don't know how to do the text to speech yet Often show on reason and theology. Uh, let's talk about Jesus in the Talmud. I've, I've had a number of people <clears throat> ask me about this subject, and they've raised a number of concerns about the way Jesus. Oh, Tahano said, so Tahano Groyper said, yeah, I'm reading the introduction to ecclesiology by Andrew Willard Jones, as well as his one on church and state. I was actually interested in his introduction to ecclesiology. Can you send me like maybe some excerpts from it? Is it very saint heavy? Because I, I really want. I've been looking for more ecclesiology books that just like reference what the saints have said about ecclesiology. Um, like I have a really good book uh, related to that called like Mary in the church by father Hugo Rahner. 
that's really good on that. But I'm looking for more books in that way. If, if that if that one is one of them, please send me some excerpts from it. I would love to buy it. Is uh, seemingly depicted in the Talmud. And for those who are not familiar with the Talmud, so this is um, part of the Jewish religion. And the Talmud is a very, very large series of books. It's like a whole library. Um, and it contains a lot of stuff in it. What's considered to be oral tradition of the Law of Moses, as well as commentary and um, all sorts of things in it. And so <clears throat> that's effectively what the Talmud is, and it's highly venerated. By the way, essentially everything that makes up the Talmud was condemned by Jesus. In, in the sense of, you know, the the Pharisees, right, the Talmudic, you, you, you know, the, the followers of the Talmud, right, the modern-day Talmudic rabbinical Jews are essentially descendants of the Pharisees. So they follow, right, you know, essentially what the Pharisees were doing by the time of Jesus, where they had added a bunch of things to the moral law, that, or moral law, the, the oral law that was never passed down from Moses, a bunch of like new commandments and new legalisms and stuff like that. And it gets so ridiculous that it's like you have that like neighborhood in New York where it's like they, they strung up fishing wire all around it so they can still technically do business on Saturdays on the Sabbath, right? And they're inside their own house, but it's like they're just in their neighborhood and they still do business within it because they strung up this fishing wire that suddenly makes them not venerate or uh, not venerate, not follow the law um, that they're bound to. And they even have those like light switches that it's like, oh, well, I'm technically not turning turning off the light switch because it's like a it's like a beam that. Um, that that actually is just blocked by the switch and so when i turn it off i'm not technically turning off the light switch and it's like this is literally like the kind of following the the you know uh, uh essentially the the uh re the rabbi's law right that our lord condemned right where it's like they find these ways to get around the, the law that they apparently elevate and follow um they're always hypocrites about it you know it's like they they completely missed the letter of like why G like why God the Father gave Moses the law in the first place, and that law was to be fulfilled with Jesus Christ, right? And it's like they 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 continue to elevate uh, man's law, man's traditions, not God, right? Not not apostolic tradition, meaning the teaching that Jesus passed down to us through the apostles but man's tradition, right? These traditions that they invented much later on after the time of Moses and they venerate to such an extent where it becomes idolatry. You know, I mean, you, you literally have in the Talmud a rabbi correcting God and saying that God's the one who's wrong. That can never happen. God, God is so much bigger than you or I that we are always the ones that are wrong if we contravene against God, not the other way around. And it's it's ridiculous that that, that would be elevated as some standard of of you know uh some standard essentially to uh to follow you know what i mean sorry i was just seeing something uh that uh someone texted me from my email okay we're good um but y y you know it's like they they elevate this idol tree to such an extent that again they literally believe they could correct god no that's blasphemous that's evil you can't correct god in any way shape or form um, Tejano said, uh, the book is somewhat saint heavy, but it really focuses on scriptural use as well as theological presuppositions of the Ecclesia. Uh, it's very much an intro in, in that it doesn't go into rabbit holes. Oh, well that still sounds cool though. I'd, I'd love to check that out. Um, James E. Boy said, a visiting Jesuit priest told my parish that he went to seminary with a Jew convert who still did that stuff. Yeah, that, that's not good, man. I, he, you know, Judaizing is, is not is not good it's 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 evil we should avoid it uh and we should condemn it anywhere we see it uh, judaizing denies um what christ has brought you know what i mean the duck said imagine trying to uh trick god that's what i'm saying dude duck w duck w in chat the talmud is just a big amount of cope redeem zoomer okay that's an rzw dude dude the duck and rz are having w's out here that's so true I mean, the Talmud is basically just a big legal collection of man-made traditions. That's all it is, right? 
they they have no precedent in the law of Moses. They have no precedent in what God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. It's just a bu- what a bunch of rabbis added later on to follow their legalism and stuff like that. That they don't they they, they themselves don't even follow, right? And the New Testament talks about it's like if you're going to follow the law, follow it to the nth degree. But they never do, right? They give all these heavy burdens to everybody else that that you know we're all expected to follow and stuff like that. But of course, it's like you know, there, there is, there is, uh, you, you know, they don't have to follow it. They can, they can contravene against, against the law and stuff like that. Uh, thank you anonymous for the $5, man. I really appreciate it. Let me just check what you said. So, um, if it's, if it's something, uh, that I, I need to be, uh, on guard of because I you know trolling's fine but I don't want it to be like some like weird thing that you just said <laughs> um just making sure it's all good um let me check here parody oh Deutero <laughs> Deutero comical dude a Deutero comical video was this from Deutero comical let's go dude okay we need to watch this I'm totally down with this this is gonna crack this is gonna crack us up, man. I'm so excited. Let's go. Um, Richard Ethiopian said, God bless you, Pine Step. Love your content and your attitude. Well, thank you, Richard. I really appreciate that, man. That means a lot. So it was uh pagan influence from the Babylonians. Um, that I would have to study more. I don't wanna I don't wanna make any um claims that I can't back up. So that I would have to study more. Um, I'm sure it definitely was. I'm sure it definitely was influenced from, you know, uh, the paganism of the Babylonians. Um, but I mean, before, you know, like when you had like the Maccabees and stuff like that, the Maccabees are our forefathers in faith. They followed God, how God deigned. Um, and it's sad because like the Pharisees ultimately came from like men like the Maccabees who were such great followers of God and would have followed Jesus Christ. Right. Um, and, and they became these like twisted descendants right of these wonderful men of faith you know uh, the men of faith who literally pushed out the hellenized jews out of um israel and stuff like that because they were practicing paganism and religious syncretism and stuff like that um caught your recent debate were you able to look more in the for all thing i never heard it before great job though i am going to do an entire episode on that i i'm, I'm looking into it right now um and again, it's like one of those things where it's going to be easily debunked. I, I know it will be. Um, and and it, and it's like, again, like it doesn't invalidate the mass. It's it, th- that's what that's what uh, uh, Mr. Condit couldn't understand. It's not an invalidating thing to the mass by any means. It doesn't pertain to the actual consecration and any, you know, the, the change in language does not pertain to the consecration, right? It doesn't pertain to the consecration in any way, shape, or form. And so for him to say that that would somehow make the mass inv- invalid, again, is not something that uh, lines up with the facts as they are. Um, and I, I, I didn't prepare, like I said, I hadn't prepared for him to throw out that argument. I was expecting him to more throw out like uh, St. Robert Bellierman and stuff like that. But even in the bit of reading that I did after, it's like, yeah, pre-Vatican II theologians were talking about how you know, we're differences in language like that would not pertain to the validity of ma- the mass being contravened. You know what I mean? Uh, all or many aren't even mutually exclusive terms. Yes, very true, my friend. Um, there is a video here on YouTube of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth praying the entire rosary in Latin. It's really good. I think I have seen that actually. Uh, I personally wasn't able to find the part in, in Trent that it says the usage would completely nullify the consecration. Beyond that. Could it not just be seen as disciplinary decree that was overturned? Well, and 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 it was just at most like a mistranslation in a local, local vernacular. You know what I mean? But but again, it's like even that mistranslation wouldn't be invalidating the mass. And and to say that it is, uh, I don't think can hold water just based on what we know about about the mass and what makes a mass valid or invalid. Um. He's such a boomer that he might as well wear a QAnon shirt. Mr. Condit's very nice, but yeah, I mean, like the body double with Cardinal Siri and stuff like that. I don't know who would take that seriously, bro. I mean, Cardinal Siri, like everyone's a body double. Everyone's been whacked, uh, you know, by the CIA. Everyone, the communists and the Freemasons. It's like to such an extent, like 
There are so many presuppositions that you need to hold to make that theory true that just statistic by by statistical probability alone, it would be an invalidating theory. You know what I mean? It's like it's the Freemasons, it's the communists, it's this group, it's that. And it's like you have all these super orthodox theologians and um, you know saints and stuff like that who didn't think that that was the case at all. I mean, what am I fa? <laughs> One of my favorite theologians to bring up is uh, Father Francis Connell. Father Francis Connell is extremely uh, orthodox. He's an extremely faithful Catholic theologian, and he attended the council, right? And he was he was uh, 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 really, really, really conservative, really, really, really faithful. And after the council, he said he was like, the council is completely orthodox. He's like, there's no issue, Right. He didn't think that, you know, St. Paul VI was an anti-pope and St. John the Twenty-Third, but it's like, okay, Gerard de Lariers, who was writing, like, years, I think, after the council even happened, I think he, like, came up with the Sede Privationist theory um, in, like, the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, maybe the late 60s, but it's, like, only after then he finds out that, like, you know, the pope's not the pope, or, like, or with the Sede Privationist theory, it was actually... He believed that the Pope was the Pope, but that, like, the Pope lost his authority or whatever, which doesn't make any sense, right? That he, like, lost his authority to teach because he taught heresy. That doesn't make any sense at all. Jordan Knox said, Pine Sap, what do you think about Anglo-Catholics? I think Anglo-Catholics are very well-intentioned, but I think ultimately they just need to bite the bullet and convert. I, I think it's one of those things where it's, like, people just kind of, you know, uh, uh, really trying to, like, tiptoe closer and closer to being catholic but not quite getting there and it really comes down to a pride thing it's like look dude this is the true church of jesus christ and there's no way of, uh, of getting around that and you know some people like uh you know calvin robinson who i think he was ordained by an old catholic so he technically would be technically a priest so like father calvin robinson it's like father calvin calvin robinson needs to just bite the bullet and stop being so prideful and, and just become Catholic already. You know what I mean? It's like he he is he's trying to like toe this line where he's like Catholic but he's not Catholic and it's like, dude, you just gotta bite the bullet and and and, and become Catholic at this point. Like this is getting ridiculous. Gabriel said the debate seemed to go a lot more into conspiracy than actual theology. The church can never err. Either it means it'll it, it never did err or whatever did air is in the church. I don't think he fully defended it. I would completely agree with that. He started to gish gallop. This is what Sedes do all the time. They start to gish gallop. They start to just say a bunch of things. You know, he mentioned offhand, oh, the consecration of bishops isn't isn't legitimate and stuff like that. That's been answered by a number of Catholic apologists and, and theologians and stuff like that. And it's it just doesn't make any sense. You know, it's very simple for for a Catholic to look at Vatican One, look at the fathers of Vatican One, look at what they said, saying, "Yep, entire church can't follow an anti-pope." You know, peaceful, peaceful and universal acceptance makes the pope the pope. You know, it's it really is that simple. And if you have to get mired in all this sort of, um, you know, all this sort of uh, uh, obscurity and 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 all these kinds of weird conspiracy theories it's probably because truth is not on your side truth be told uh it's all james bond in their head bro they say zoomers are brain fried but tbh tbh are but honestly act 80s action movies ruin boomers very true bro um are eastern catholics limited in god's grace because the right is not roman no of course not dude Mass is mass. Divine liturgy is divine liturgy. They're not. They're not uh, limited in any way, shape, or form. Um, no, uh, you know, Byzantine Catholics, Eastern Catholics are fully Catholic, and Roman Catholics are fully Catholic. No, there's no, there's no limitation in in, in grace in any way, shape, or form. To to assert that would be uh, a, a monumental error. Uh, Sedes are only good when they call it the SSPX. Other than that, they're an L. Honestly. That is so true, dude. I get a I get along with Sedes when we talk about how inconsistent the ecclesiology of the SSPX is, and we we actually get a uh, get along really great because they're like, look, they're like, if the Pope's a Pope, you got to follow the Pope, and I'm like, yeah, dude, I agree. Now, you know, you got to accept that Pope Francis is the Pope. Now we gotta, you know, you gotta repent of your error, but um, yeah, they're they're completely right when they call out the inconsistencies of the SSPX. I mean, recognize and resist just as a theological principle is not a consistent the theology, and it doesn't have really any theological 
foundation in the church's corpus of tradition at all. Like even trying to cite like St. Thomas Aquinas on resisting a prelate or whatever, it's like you can't do that for five pontificates and resist an ecumenical council and assert that the Pope repeatedly in the authentic magisterium or even in the OUM, the ordinary universal magisterium, is somehow taught uh, error or somehow a modernist. And it's like Lefebvre was saying that like Rome was uh run by antichrists like he said that in his 1988 uh letter to to you know future bishops right he said that rome was run by antichrist and it's like how can you believe all that and still remain in this position like oh yeah i guess the pope's the pope but he's also literally a modernist heretic neo-protestant it's like that doesn't make any sense man um Roundtable said their arguments against the validity of the new consecration of bishops and priests and the new mass are very bad. Extremely true, my brother. I like how Pinesap stayed on the main thesis throughout the debate. Yes, thank you, your boy, EB. Yeah, and, and, and like, that brings me to something else. That brings me to a little bit of a rant. And and look, I love this Discord channel. Fully supportive of them. Fully love them. Uh, I know the main guy who runs it, Mosin, or, or I, is it Mosin who runs Papacy Hub? I believe it is Mosin. Mosin's a wonderful man. I have nothing horrible or awful to say about Mosin. I love Mosin to death. And this is not a criticism of him. Um, but like, I got this message from Discord the other day. And it's this guy adding me in Papacy Hub, right? And he's like, Pine Sap, what were you thinking when you had that Sede Vacantis debate? And I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, giving giving witness to Jesus Christ, helping people who are let misled in that error be exposed to the true faith. Like, what was I thinking? Exactly that. And he starts like, he starts trying to big bro me. He's like, he's like, well, you should know the fact that Sede's gish gallop and, and could just even uh, supplant a little bit of doubt in the mind of people watching and stuff like that. And saying that I was being irresponsible. It's like, dude, I knew where Jim was at with his, his level of knowledge. Okay. I knew where my level was at. I knew that it wasn't going to be an easy blow away debate, but I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to be horrible either. Right. And, and this guy tries to like big bro me and tell me off. And then I've got this dude with a literal anime profile picture, literally of an anime girl trying to, trying to talk to me about the prudence of having a debate with Sede. Okay, homie, you literally have a profile picture of an anime girl. So let's slow our roll a little bit. Who's being more scandalous here? I don't have the picture. I don't have the profile picture of like a 14 year old anime girl. And you're over here trying to bust my hump about, you know, I, he started doing this I, I, again. This goes back to the well-meaning, you know, the well-meaning Catholic thing I complained about. He's, he's like, well, do you know Latin to read the original ecclesiological works and stuff like that? I'm like, what does that have to do with the price of bananas? Like I can read books that are translated, right? Reading Latin's awesome. I'm not dissing that in the slightest, but it's like he try, you know, he's trying to do this big man thing with me. And I'm like, dude, you have an anime girl as your profile picture. Sit your butt down. <laughs> Till that changes, you don't have a bit, you don't have business telling anyone what scandal or, or being imprudent is, you know? But I, I, I just love it. It's like, it's like, you know, these guys don't do anything for anybody and they sit on Discord all day and puff out their chest and act real big and like, I'm based. I know what I'm talking about, you know? Do they, do they you know, try to help people like, like come to realize the gospel? No. I don't think they do. I think they just want to sit there and act superior all day and stuff like that. And, and, and it's a big problem. And so I hate discord, man. I it's full of just these arrogant smug people who can't see the log in their own eye. Right. Want to browbeat me about having the debate with the set a, but then it's like, you literally have a profile picture of an anime girl, dude. Really? You get, you don't catch me doing that stuff. And listen, I've made bad. You guys all know I've made sussy jokes and stuff like that. I, Fair enough. You can criticize my behavior about, you know, I've cur I've said curse words and I've made, you know, very, very sussy jokes and stuff like that to troll people and stuff like that. I'm not perfect, right? And I need to learn to be better at that too. Fully can fully admit that, right? Not confess that. That sounds weird. Fully admit that. 
But it's like really you're trying to like big man me and it's like you've got an anime girl as your profile picture and you're trying to be this like this nerd who's like, um, do you even read Latin, bro? Do you even read Latin? Well, again, nothing's wrong with reading Latin. I I want to learn to read Latin one day. That'd be awesome, honestly. I, I want to learn to read, uh, you know, Greek and Latin and stuff like that. But really trying to trying to pull this whole like you're you're better than me and stuff like that come on you know go pound sand man really discord man honestly a cesspool of degeneracy and i love papacy hub it's a great channel i even recommend it you know please go join and you know and and respect and follow their rules or whatever don't troll but you know join join with all sincerity but it's like come on really man you know, just just an absolute absolute cesspool. Not Papacy Hub, but just Discord. I I love Papacy Hub. Again, go and go and join Papacy Hub. It's awesome. A lot of great um, a lot of great resources on multiple different topics. I I contribute uh some books I'll find and stuff like that to some of the channels. It's it's a great place for Catholic apologetics. But I mean, just just the terminally online Discord bros. Just I can't stand them, dude. Oh man. Yeah, the Castman debate was imprudent because Castman has an has an inconsistent ecclesiology. He couldn't even answer when when Diamond said, "Does Pope Francis per profess the true faith?" My answer would have been, "Yeah, he does, and you don't." Right? Would have been super easy. But Castman, because he thinks that Pope Francis is like evil and stuff like that, couldn't even answer that, and the debate was lost at that point. Ignatian Crusader said, "The Catholics I have issues with are the ones who care about being based." But their pastoral knowledge is completely trash. Well, that's the thing. It's like they 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 try to hold it over you that like they they're you know reading some book that hasn't even been translated into English. And like again, I'm not condemning that. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. We need people who can who can you know uh, read works from the 15th century and stuff like that that haven't even been translated yet. I'm not good at that stuff, right? We need people like that. I'm not dissing that in the slightest. But when they use it as this like moment to be like <laughs> listen little bro i know more than you okay i know more than you it's like dude come on man really like that's just nasty man you don't need to be like that you know don't use don't use the knowledge that god has graced you with to be able to read that stuff to then hold it over other people and act like the big man on campus no this is random but i took two years of latin in high school and it was pretty fun but wasn't easy by any stretch yeah latin's a tough language man um, I mean, I know a lot of the prayers of the rosary in Latin and, and I know how to read a little bit, but I'm still, I'm still trying. I still definitely got to sit down and, uh, sit down and work on it. You know what I mean? Little flower joy or roast, <laughs> roasting or roasting in hell, but I was based. Yeah, that's so true, dude. King Laffy meat. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, dude. Maybe some sussy stuff. Um, let's see. Has modern monarchists ever stopped being a sede? Unfortunately, no, Kristoff. We should pray for him. Uh, he, he's a good man. We should pray for him. Um, he unfortunately, I think, has kind of uh, adopted adopted that, that sede mindset, and that's not good. Yeah, especially a problem amongst online orthobros. Yikes, yeah. You want to talk about terminally online people, you know, look no further, right? Twitter is equally bad, though. I've been reading... I've been uh, better being off it for Lent now. Well, that's good, man. Yeah, I'd completely agree with that. Talano says, oh, you're reading Latin? Yeah, I just went to adoration. Know your place. Yeah, that's real. And look, I, it's not a thing about, like, I'm not holier than any of those guys that I'm complaining about. Like, you know, I'm sure they're way holier than I am and, and they're they're praying 10 times the amount I am and stuff like that. It's not a thing about that, but it's just like, really, man? Like, I, I'm trying to help people, you know? I'm trying to help people the best I can, man. And I know my pride's conflated in that and, and va vanity and stuff like that. And that's something I'm trying to work on. But it's like, give me a break, dude. I'm human. You know what I mean? It's like these guys are looking for any moment to see you slip up. They just want to see you fail. And, and you're trying your best and you're trying to help other people. But it's like any little moment they can stick against you, they never let you live it down. And I'm, I'm sick of interacting with people like that. You know? It's like if you're going to come into my DMs or you're going to at me in some channel or whatever and try and like, you know, have that kind of conversation, I don't want to talk to you, quite frankly, because you don't have my best interest at heart. You're not try trying to talk to me like a brother. You're just trying to ha get one over on me. And it's like, 
People like that should just be ignored, man. Hello, Pine Sap. Have you ever read Cassie Kanubi? I've read excerpts. Not I've d not done like a full reading of the entire cyclical encyclical back to back, but I've read the relevant portions. Beautiful, beautiful encyclical on maintaining um, the the uh, sanctity of marriage and stuff like that, and avoiding things that undermine that. Uh, I love I love Cassie Kanubi. Yo, Steven, dude. Steven in chat. Hi, Pine Sap. Hey, Steven, what's up, buddy? I hope you're doing okay. I I know you've had a rough time with you know, what your folks did and stuff like that. But man, we're, we're here for you. I'm, I'm praying for you, dude. And I'm glad to see that the give, send go has been excellent. If you guys haven't donated to that yet, I please consider giving, um, giving to Steven's, uh, give, send go. He was kicked out of his parents' house because he wants to become Catholic and stuff like that. And, and this man is suffering for the kingdom of God, man. And that's a beautiful thing. I'm so proud of, I'm so proud of you, Steven. That's a hard thing to do, man. Thoughts on the Word on Fire Bible or Bishop Barron in general? I love Bishop Barron, and I've heard the Word on Fire Bible is really, really good. Catholic book coppers read all the books, but you can't get them to a charity event. Yeah, well, and and it's like, look, I'm I'm a I'm a book copper. You know, I I buy books all the time and stuff like that. Um, and, and it's like both those things are beautiful. You should be volunteering at charity and giving to other people and spending time you know, with the corporal works of mercy and evangelizing people and helping the poor and helping those who are, who need it most. And, you know, you should be improving your theological knowledge. It's like, we can do both, you know, let's see here. Is TM at least a good source for biblical theology? Um, yeah, I mean, his older videos are really good. I still like his video on like the different levels of hell and stuff like that. Uh, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, that's a, that's a fantastic watch. Honestly, I, I fully recommend it. So we're going to watch this Deutero comical video, though. Oh. Sorry, I turned off the, uh, turn off the. Good day. Welcome back to Pints with Aquinas. As promised, today's debate will be between Dr. Taylor Marshall and Bishop Robert Barron on whether it is a mortal sin to pray the rosary in English. Taylor will be taking the affirmative position and Bishop Barron the negative. We agreed to an open discussion format, so have at it, boys. Friends, I don't even know where to begin with such a preposterous question. Why would praying the rosary in our native language be cause for grave matter? I guess since I'm taking the negative position, the only thing I can do is poke holes in the other side. We all know that Jesus would have said the rosary in Latin as a young boy at synagogue, so why should we do any different? <laughs> There is so much wrong with what you just said, but even if I grant all of that, how exactly is it a sin? It's a sin against tradition, obviously. Latin is the language of the church. So choosing to pray in any other language is an act of defiance and disobedience against Holy Mother Church. Defiance and disobedience, eh? That's really rich coming from you, Taylor. What is that supposed to mean? Don't play dumb with me. You constantly refer to Pope Francis as Bergoglio. And you frequently question the validity of Vatican II, which is the greatest council of all time, by the way. <laughs> I've never explicitly denied that Francis is the current pope. Then why don't you just call him Pope Francis? Will you go on the record by calling him that right now? Yeah, I mean, he is the pope, and he chose the name Francis. What more do you want me to say? I want you to put those two facts together whenever you reference him. Mm, okay, fine. Mm. You made me totally lose my train of thought. What were we talking about again? I don't know. But since I have you here, do you care to comment on your personal stance on the moon landing? Ugh. No, we were talking about praying the rosary in English. You'll get your chance to talk about the moon landing in your debate with Trent Horn next week. Nice. Hey. Nice. Also, who let you into the studio? I paid Thursday a hundred bucks to leave a key under the mat. Sorry, Matt. I needed the money. You should have given me that raise I've been asking for. <laughs> All right. Whatever. Just don't interrupt, please. Thursday. We'll have a talk later. Trent, did you at least lock the door after you came in? Uh, I think so. Well, we don't want other people coming in. This is Brother Peter Diamond. From <laughs> oh boy, not this guy. Who let you out of your mom's basement? Uh, were you following me or something? Yes. I've been trying to contact you regarding my challenge to debate you. You still haven't accepted it. Yeah, I decided to do something more worth my time, such as watching paint dry. Also, have you been following me all day, like even when I was at the zoo with my family earlier? Unfortunately, yes. Also, while I was at the zoo, 
there was a clown there who was performing, quote, magic tricks. He pulled a quarter out of my ear, and I cannot explain how he did this other than by the power of Satan himself. Based. So, Matt, can we kick this guy out or what? Hang on, guys. I want him to stay. I think he's going to take my side on this rosary debate. Yes. Even though you have proven yourself to be an ipso facto notorious heretic, you are correct about praying the rosary in Latin only. I'll take what I can get. Well, I don't even know if there is a point in continuing this debate. You guys have totally derailed it. That's fine. I'm honestly embarrassed that I even agreed to doing this. So, you know, I'm fine to just call it a wash and pretend this never happened. I'm sorry, Your Excellency. I didn't mean to waste your time. Will you still be able to say Holy Mass for us? Absolutely. Wow, I didn't know you learned the TLM. Uh, no, I was going to celebrate the Novus Ordo. Oh, my mistake. I thought you said you were going to celebrate Holy Mass. Seriously, dude? If he celebrated the TLM because he is a heretic. Plus, his ordination is invalid because it was done according to the missal of, quote, Pope Paul VI. It's just so bloody sad that we as Catholics can't seem to agree about anything. Yeah, is, is there anything that we can all agree about? I'm not sure, honestly. Me neither. Hey, everyone, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, get him out of here. Yeah, you need to leave. Yeah, you should probably just go... Wow, I thought all are welcome here, but I guess not. I would say heretics are not welcome here, but clearly we've already broken that rule. Hey Thursday, go ahead and kill the live stream before Mr. Diamond says something that will get us demonetized. The Holocaust is a work of propaganda by the diabolical. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! The end, dude! Like, not. <laughs> Dude, what, <laughs> what is going on, man? <laughs> okay, so like the video had like just just this build up the entire time, and like when Father James Martin came in, I thought that was pretty funny, but then just at the end, I was like, I was like, dude, this is just crazy. This is just insane, dude. I'm like, I'm dead, bro. I'm so dead. Uh, Colin Gordon asked, finds out I got the done again uh, religious liberty book PDF. Do you have a telegram or discord yeah i've got uh i've got telegram i can tell you got a little hood in your blood yeah that's so true joseph oh man that's crazy dude <laughs> oh that's insane bro <sighs> quick quick and the end the stream before Diamond says something that demonetizes the video literally just goes into like the most <laughs> just the most like like demon like not even demonetizes your video, just gets your YouTube channel like wiped from the face of the earth. Kinda of, kind of diatribe I've ever heard. Oh dude, that cracks me up, man. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, J. Cole asks, thoughts on Vladimir Soloviev? I love Vladimir Soloviev. I hope he's canonized one day, dude. I, I really uh, I really want to press for his canonization. He's he's incredible. Um, he's had a big influence on me. And I, I think, I mean, there's a reason why he has the nickname the Russian Newman. Because he really is like St. John Henry Newman, but from like an Eastern Orthodox background rather than like a, uh, an Anglican background. You know what I mean? Excuse me, sorry. But yeah, dude, that's incredible. <laughs> that's absolutely incredible. Um, I think someone was asking about Casti Kanubi.59. I just want to check that out real quick. Let's see. 
Um, Holy Church knows well that not infrequently one of the parties is sinned against rather than sinning when for that grave cause he or she reluctantly allows the perversion of the right order. In such case, there is no sin provided that the mindful law of charity he or she does not neglect to dissuade or deter the partner from sin, nor are those considered as acting against nature who in the married state use their right in the proper manner, although on account of natural reasons, either time or of certain defects, new life cannot uh, be brought forth. Okay, so um, I'm going to finish and I'll, I'll explain what 50.59 is talking about. For in matrimony, as well as uh, in the use of matrimonial rights, there are also secondary ends such as mutual aid, the cultivating mutual love, the quieting of con uh, conspicu uh, conspic uh, uh, conspicuance, which husband and wife are not forbidden to consider so long as they are subordinated to the primary end as long as the intrinsic nature of the act is preserved. So what he, uh, what our Holy Father, blessed, uh, blessed Pius XI, sorry, he's not blessed, but uh, Pope Pius XI is saying is if we go to the first sentence, he's talking about um, if you had a wife or a husband that was trying to encourage, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, the, I believe it, I believe it's the use of contraception and they insisted upon, or, or actually, I take that back. Hold on. So if I'm understanding it correctly, because, you know, encyclicals are written sometimes not with the direct language in regards to this topic because it could be scandalous to those reading it. It's talking about how if, like, a wife, right, had like her her husband insisted upon you know we need to perform the marital act and i'm going to use contraception if the wife right tried to dissuade the um the husband or whatever from using contraception and all that but you know he still insisted in the act was performed the wife would not be culpable for the sin but the husband would be because the husband insisted upon it Right. So if the husband insisted upon like using contraception or something like that, and the wife had taken every care to try and dissuade him, but the act happened, uh, she would not be culpable for mortal sin, but he would be culpable for mortal sin since he fully consented to using contraception, but she did not. Um, so then, uh, then we go to the second part. Um, nor are those considering as acting against nature who in the married state use their right in the proper manner, although on account of natural reasons, either of time or of certain defects, new life cannot be brought forth. So this would be like if you couldn't, if if a wife, and, sorry, I think he was reconnecting. If the wife was having a hard time getting pregnant, but they they did the marital act, not using contraception or something like that, and there was no pregnancy that happened um, as a result of just you know, the, the, those defects, um, as Pope Pius XI talks about, there would be no sin occurred. Likewise, if there was that act was performed during the, uh, low point of the woman's, um, uh, uh, fertile cycle, right. Um, there would be no sin occurred since they still were open to, to life in that, right. There was no use of contraception or anything like that. And then he just talks about how, you know, in marriage, right, there there are the secondary aspects of the marital act, such as mutual aid, cultivating mutual love, and, and quieting uh, those feelings of lust or what have you by uh, doing the act in its its proper way. Hence why it says, subordinating the primary end, and as long as the intrinsic, intrinsic nature of the act is preserved. You know what I mean? Um, so that's what point 59 means, basically. To give a give, give an overview, I should say. Um, but I know we wanted to go back to the Lofton video. Especially by Orthodox Jews. And uh, there are different kinds. There's the Babylonian Talmud and the Palestinian uh, Talmud. But we are going to take a look specifically, or I should say Jerusalem Talmud, I hope I believe. Um, we're going to take a look at the um, Babylonian Talmud specifically. And we're going to see how Jesus is depicted there. Again, a lot of people have raised some concerns here. And have asked me to comment on it. I've uh, done my best to look into it, and um, I've seen some of the things that people are concerned about, but I, I want to try to help put some things in perspective here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen and begin uh, with Gittin 57a in the Talmud, and you'll see what some people's concerns are. 
Uh, it speaks of on, uh, Onkelos, who was a Roman um, official, a Roman individual who converted to <clears throat> Judaism, but prior to his conversion, he um, uh, he consulted several people. From um, so let's see here. Richard said, which document was that? Casti Canubi by Pope Pius XI, which talks about like marriage. Uh, it was one of the first documents to uh, one of the I think it was actually the first encyclical to condemn contraception. Um, and then that, of course, was re uh, re condemned in Humanae Vitae from the dead to see what the afterlife was like. And here it uh, notes something about Jesus the Nazarene. So it says, Onkelos uh, then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy. Onkelos said to him, who is the most important in that world where you are now? Jesus said to him, the Jewish people. Onkelos uh, asked him, should I then attach myself to them in this world? Because he's considering, you know, converting. Jesus said to him, their welfare you shall seek, their misfortune you shall not seek. For anyone who touches them is regarded as if he were touching the apple of his eye. And then it continues. A little bit below here. Ankelos said to him, what is the punishment of that man? And this is noted as a euphemism for Jesus himself in the next world. Jesus said to him, he is punished with boiling excrement. So this is what gives rise to some people um, being concerned that the <clears throat> Talmud describes uh, Jesus as boiling in excrement in the afterlife. It continues, as the master said, anyone who mocks the words of the sages will be sentenced to boiling excrement. And this was his sin, as he mocked the words of the sages. The Gemara comments, come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. As Balaam, who was a prophet, wished Israel harm, <clears throat> whereas Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a Jewish sinner, sought their well-being. And, you know, previous to this, it discusses Balaam and describes him as boiling in semen. Well, Okay, so you can see why some people would be concerned by the way this is described here. It speaks of a Jesus the Nazarene, you know, boiling in excrement. That sounds like this is a reference to um, Jesus of Christianity, right? And so uh, some people have been very concerned about this, and you even find in church history instances where uh, Talmuds were burned in part because of these kinds of concerns. And it was completely justified that that horrible blasphemous document was burned especially when St. Louis, uh, St. Louis the ninth burned cartfuls of Talmuds, the absolutely evil document, absolutely blasphemous. I'm so glad that Nicholas Donnan went to Pope Gregory the ninth and told them about the evils of the Talmud. But we have to ask the question, is this actually the Jesus, Jesus, the Nazarene that we um, hold to in Christianity, or is this a different Jesus, the Nazarene? This may sound like at first, oh, well, you know, this is uh, absurd. Of course, this is referring to the Jesus of the Christians. But actually, if you look at the rest of the Talmud, it's not very clear that this is the Jesus that we Christians um, worship. And, and if, you know, it, it's possible it is, but the way this Jesus the Nazarene is described in many other parts of the Talmud, it does not appear to be um, the Jesus that we as Christians hold to. It seems that it was a different person because, again, he is described very differently in the Talmud <clears throat> and also anachronistically. Uh, he's described as living in a very different time period than the one uh, that we hold to as Christians. And so uh, this is why you can find Jews themselves, like Jews for Judaism, who say that this Jesus in the Talmud <clears throat> is not, specifically the one uh, that is boiling in excrement, is not the Jesus. You hear that, guys? The group that has everything to benefit from denying that the Talmud is just literally, literally saying what it's saying is saying that that's actually not our Lord in the Talmud. But it's a different it's a different figure. Wow. That's crazy, dude. That's that's insane. I d definitely no cover up going on there. None at all, guys. Guys, that would be that would be just a bunch of conspiracy theories, man. So, um we're going to go to the uh section um where we clearly know that this is the So um, we're gonna we're gonna be reading through Schaefer's text a little bit, and to be completely transparent with you guys, I haven't read Schaefer's text back to back, just excerpts and stuff like that, and reviews. I, I've seen other people do it, um, but I have read a little bit of uh, 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 I have read just a couple excerpts of it and stuff like that. Right? Um, Fernando said, uh, "Bro, I told you Lofton was a clown." Here's the thing about Lofton; he does good stuff. 
right? I mean, I, I think his video on like, I think his videos on like church politics and situating the right mindset about like Pope Francis and stuff like that. Those videos are good. I, I, I like those videos, but it's like when he gets to stuff like this, he's, he's like the first person to kind of try and like run cover for, you know, this group that, that absolutely blasphemes our Lord. I mean, you know, myotomies, right? The famous Jewish philosopher wrote in his epistle to Yemen, right? Blasphemies against our Lord, right? Total arrogant blasphemies against our Lord. And every single time he would say our Lord's name, he would always say after, and I'm, I'm not saying this, I'm just repeating his words to give an example, you know, may his bones be ground to dust. It's like, you don't get that, that anti-Christian attitude from just nowhere, right? And it's contained in the Talmud. And we're going to read it. I'm just, I'm just seeing, uh, I'm just seeing what y'all are saying in chat. Wow. How could anyone buy that? Yeah. Very true. J Cole and King Laffy dart on the dartboard. Yeah. Completely agree, bro. Hit, hit the nail on the head. Uh, bullseye. It's crazy that Lofton made such a dog crap apologetic for the Talmud that it forced personalities in the online Catholic spheres who don't normally talk about the Talmud to talk about it. That's what I'm saying, dude. It's like, y you know, like Lofton really like we're running cover for this blasphemous evil text that like our lord condemned right i mean our lord the talmud was not written down when our when our lord um was doing his earthly ministry but it's like the law that became the talmud was right so this is what schaefer says in the introduction of his book and we're going to read the relevant sections too i i just controlled f boiling because that should get us to the point so he says the most bizarre of all G the Jesus stories is the one where he tell uh, that tells how Jesus shares his place in the netherworld with Titus and Balaam, the notorious arch enemies of the Jewish people. Whereas Titus is punished for the destruction of the temple by being burned to ashes, reassembled and burned over and over again. And whereas Balaam is ca uh, castigated by sitting in hot semen, goodness gracious, that's horrible. Jesus's fate consi consists of sitting forever in boiling excrement. This obscene story has occupied scholars for a long time without any satisfactory solution. I will speculate that it is, again, the deliberate and quite graphic answer to a New Testament claim. This time, Jesus promised that eating his flesh and drinking his blood guarantees eternal life to his followers. Understood this way, the story conveys an ironic message. Not only did Jesus not rise from the dead... He is punished in hell forever. Accordingly, his followers, the blossoming church, which maintains a new Israel, are nothing but a bunch of fools mis misled by a cunning deceiver. I mean, it's like you don't get much... Like, that is the most evil thing I've ever read. That is the most, like, wicked and blasphemous thing I have ever read. I hated even having to repeat that. That's just, that's just disgusting, dude. That's, that's gross. Like that, that's an evil, like what an evil thing to say, dude. I mean, it, it's just so nasty. Yes, a terrible, and Ignatian's like, okay, now I'm, I'm mad too. It's horrible. Right? Fernando said, did you see Tim Gordon on, uh, oh, one America news? He brought up the Talmud, and you can hear the producer say, "We aren't running that." He played the clip of the uh, of his stream at, today uh, towards the end. Yeah, well, it's because they're bought out, right? They're bought out by the people who don't like Jesus at all, right? So sorry, I'm just reading the relevant section, right? So in the section that that Lofton read off uh schaefer's talking about this and i'm able to kind of scan uh close enough to understand it's like is it talking about jesus or is it talking about another you know another person right and i think so So it seems like we're kind of getting in the relevant section. So now Jesus slash the sinners of hell or sinners of hell, sinners of Israel. We do not hear anything about uh, his or their crime and cannot therefore explain that uh, the punishment, which is bizarre enough as a consequence of any particular crime. The Talmud editor in his first comment on uh, Jesus slash sinners of Israel, part of our narrative, encounters the same problem. The anonymous master alludes to the only parallel from the 
uh, uh, Bavli, uh, which uh, mentions boiling excrement as a punishment. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Ecle- uh, I believe that's Ecclesiastes 12.12. Uh, 12. Rav Papa, the son of Rav uh, Ahabar Ada, said in the uh, name of Rav Ahabar uh, Ula, this teaches us whoever ridicules the words of the sages is punished by immersion in boiling excrement. Rava objected, but it is written ridicules, rather what is uh, written is study. Hence, um, this is the correct interpretation. He who studies them, the words of the sages, fe- uh, feels the taste of need. So, uh, we go on. So this conclusion, so they're they're kind of talking about um, this conclusion, however, does not yet solve the enigma of the crime committed by Jesus and the deeper meaning of the punishment. We follow against uh, Tosefta's categorization. We have Balaam as the representative of the sinners and the nations, and Titus as the representative of the destroyer of the temples. This leaves us either with the cate- uh, with either. Um, the sinners of Israel or the heretics as the appropriate category for Jesus. If we forgo Bavli's artificial and probably secondary identification of Jesus with the sinners of Israel, we can put Jesus into the category of the heretics and then have Titus for the destroyers of the temple, Balaam for the sinners of the nations, and Jesus for the heretics. The first and third punishment in uh, Gehenna forever, the second release into non-existence after 12 months. With this solution, we finally arrive at the crime for Jesus. He has no portion of the world to come and is accordingly punished in uh, uh, Gehinnom because he is one of the worst heretics that people of Israel have ever produced. Moreover, according to Tostefta's taxonomy, he is punished in uh, Gehinnom forever, like Titus. And this is clearly the essence of uh, Bavli's statement about Jesus. It claims, as in B. Barakat, but much more forcefully, that Jesus was not only never resurrected from the dead, but that he sits in Gehenna together with the other sinners who are denied in afterlife and is punished there forever. This, of course, sends all a strong message to his followers, telling them that they better give up any hope for an afterlife for themselves as with their hero, there is no afterlife reserved for him. They will be punished in uh, Gehenna forever. But this, the, uh, but what then about the meaning of Jesus' punishment? There is any connection with his crime, and it is not merely modeled along the lines of Balaam's punishment with no deeper meaning. In Titus's case, we have a link between the burning the temple and burning Titus's body. Balaam's case, a link between enticing Israel into sexual orgies and sitting in hot semen. So then, what would be Jesus's heresy and sitting and his sitting in hot excrement? Goodness gracious, man. Since the text does not give any clue, as in the case of Titus, and since we cannot use the Hebrew Bible to fill the gap left in the Bavli text, as in the case of Balaam, we can only speculate, and this is what I am prepared to do. We are looking for a connection between Jesus' heresy and his punishment, and I propose a connection as bizarre as the punishment. The Talmud does not tell us that the, the heresy was that Jesus propagated, but we can safely assume with our knowledge of the other texts discussed um, that it must have to do with idolatry. Idolatry and blasphemy. Uh, idolatry and blasphemy. The first and obvious possibility that comes to mind is Jesus' discussion with the Pharisees in the New Testament when the Pharisees ask why Jesus' disciples do not wash their hands before they eat. Jesus explains to the crowd following him that, quote, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that, the mouth that defiles. The disciples get a more detailed explanation. Do you not see that whatever goes in the mouth enters the stomach and then goes out into the sewer? But what comes out out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Hence, what Jesus apparently argues in this Pharisaic purity rules do not really matter. Uh, or argues is that the Pharisaic purity rules do not really matter. What is important is not the purity of the hands or the food, 
Because food is processed within the body and any inherent impurity will be excreted and ends up in the sewer, but the purity of the heart. In other words, not, not food is impure, but human intentions and actions are impure. The rabbinic counter narrative about Jesus' punishment would then ironically invert his attack on the Pharisee purity laws by having him sit in excrement and teaching him the lesson. You believe that only what comes out of the mouth defiles. Well, you will sit forever in your own excrement and will finally understand that what goes uh, into the mouth and comes out of the stomach defiles. Unreal. Unreal. So the Talmud and its blasphemy takes the beautiful word of our Lord, which is what comes out of the heart defiles. What comes out of the heart is what condemns a man, what makes a man impure, not, not what go, goes into the mouth. And the text is very clear on this. And, and I'm even seeing the connections upon reading this, doing a cold reading of the book. But, but oh, by the way, by the way, guys, no, that's that's a different Jesus, right? Even though it's not, and literally we get confirmation that it's not. It's unbelievable, dude. It's it's just unbelievable. It's like I don't know, like how y you could sit there and like defend. Like, did did Lofton even read this book, or did he just read what some? guy trying to trying to trying to run cover for the talmud wrote because i mean you have to think about it what would be more what would be more probable if christians knew what the talmud contained they probably wouldn't be so keen on the whole judeo-christian thing would they so th th there's every reason to try and deny what the talmud actually says there's every impetus and every like justification to try and lie Right? Not tell the truth. I mean, I, 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 like, I want to wash out my mouth after having to even repeat those words, to be honest. And the only reason I did, of course, was to, was to read the text to you guys. Right? I, I, I didn't mean a single word that I was saying. But, it, but I feel disgusting even, even like reading that. How, how does this not make just someone infuriated? Right? It's like, I just, I just, dude, it, it, it's insane. You know what I mean? It's, it's absolutely insane how evil this document could be, how evil this collection could be. Let's see. People know that I care about Mike. His work on FS was invaluable as well as his dissecting, dis dissecting of the Pope Francis controversies. I think he's really here wrong, though. We'll pray for him. Absolutely, Ulster Benny. Look, I'm not going to disavow disavow Michael Lofton's good work or anything like that. He does some great work in in going over, you know, people lying about Pope Francis and stuff like that. Completely agree with that, right? But it, but it's like I just can't imagine running cover for this blasphemous text, you know? Because look. I, I have warned people about this before. Yes, there are um, uh, lists that you'll get on the internet of like Talmud verses or whatever, and they're not actually verses that were said in the Talmud. And that, you know, they, they, they're they literally like, uh, they're, they're, they're either like improper citations or it's like half quoting a text where it doesn't really say that thing. I acknowledge that. But these things are legitimate. This is just what they're actually saying. This isn't like a misrepresentation or anything like that. This is like actually what is being said in the Talmud. And it, it, it's it's unbelievable to me. It's just so disgusting, dude. You know? I can never bring myself to read what uh, is said aloud. You're a hero of the faith. I'm not a hero, dude. I'm I I am I am I am a guy just trying to do you know, trying, trying to pay penance for the sins that I've committed in my life and, and help other people get to heaven. That's it. I, you know, um, I'm not a hero by any means, but the, you know, just this stuff needs to be said, man. Cause it's like the deafening silence has got to stop. It's just disgusting. You know, it's just, it's sick. It says here, as we've explained elsewhere, Yeshua is not Jesus of the new Testament. He's most likely a prominent sectarian of the early first century who deviated from rabbinic tradition and created his own religion, combining Hellenistic paganism with Judaism. 
while Yeshu may be the proto-Jesus, some scholars point to as inspiring the early Christians, he is definitely not the man who was crucified in Jerusalem in the year 33. So that's according to this um, Jewish website, and we're going to see why um, that seems to be the case, why it doesn't appear to be uh, the Jesus of the New Testament. If you go to Sanhedrin 43a, it says, The Mishnah teaches that a crier goes out before the condemned man. This indicates that it is only before him, while he is being led to his execution, that yes, the crier goes out, but from the outset, before the accused is convicted, he does not go out. The Gemara raises a difficulty, but isn't it taught in Baraita? On Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene. Now, hey, wasn't uh, Jesus, you know, hung around the time of Passover, and, and he's a Nazarene, right? So doesn't that sound like the Jesus of the New Testament? Well, watch this. After they killed him by way of stoning, that's interesting, Jesus wasn't stoned. Uh, but okay, maybe there's just a, you know, slight disconnect here, but maybe it's still referring to the Jesus of the New Testament. Let's continue. And a crier went out before him for 40 days, publicly proclaiming Jesus the Nazarene is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery. I, Jesus practiced sorcery? Um, no, I'm not familiar with the Jesus of the New Testament practicing sorcery and being stoned, but okay. Incited people to idol worship. Um, I, this doesn't sound like the Jesus of the New Testament, y'all. Um, incited people to idol worship, practice sorcery. was Dog, you can't... Lofton, buddy, you can't be serious right now. Are you kidding me? Dude, this is what they believe. Like, yes, Jesus didn't die of stoning because the Talmud's wrong. Are you, like, is he seriously making the claim that because the Talmud gets the death of our Lord wrong, that it's like, guys, this couldn't possibly be the same, same, uh, you know, this couldn't possibly be our Lord. This couldn't po guys, this couldn't possibly be our Lord. That just doesn't make any sense, guys. I mean, Lofton, you gotta be kidding me, man. Really? Really? We're 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 seriously making that argument. <sighs> Dude, I, this just kills me. This kills me. And again, we're gonna go probably the Schaefer text and we're gonna see exactly what. Um, I'm actually going to see if there's a good synopsis of the text, maybe so I don't have to. Would. Let's see here. That's okay. We'll just go through the book. I can't seem to find any. I was just seeing if there was like a condensed list so I didn't have to look through the text, but that's fine. We'll just hang out together. I'm, I'm fine with taking that time. I think I just found what we're looking for. I think we just found what we're looking for.
Sorry, guys. Not trying to not trying to bore you. I'm just trying to find the. Uh, it's hard to do a cold reading of this, so I'm just trying to find the. Uh, Okay, here we go. We we get we get exactly what we need. So we go back to the text. <clears throat> so anonymous user. Hey Pine Sap. Hey buddy, what's up? How's it going? Just use loft in argument to ins <laughs> uh, insult anyone. Yeah, dude, I. I'm I'm just frankly disgusted. Like it's hard for me to read this if I'm being completely honest. So, French Thomas, you said it best. This is killing me. It's killing me too, man. So, we we basically have from what I can tell here and just skimming it, we have basically a direct address of Lofton's claim. Yes, of course. Or er, so not the historical execution, crucifixion versus stoning or hanging is at stake here, but the question of why the Talmud regards it is a matter of course, or rather insist that Jesus was executed according to rabbinic law. To answer this question, the rabbis were certainly aware that the crucifixion was the standard Roman death penalty, that Jesus was indeed crucified and not stoned and hanged, hence why their stubborn insistence on the latter. Because this is precisely at the core of their polemic, polemical counter-narrative to the Gospels, the author, the author of our uh, Bavli uh, uh, ba, uh, Barreta, does not need to distort the New Testament report as such. The fact that Jesus was put on trial and executed like an ordinary criminal was devastating enough. Such a story can hardly be made worse. Instead of the two, and indeed conflicting stories about Jesus' trial in the New Testament, uh, there's no conflicting There's no conflicting stories. Um, he chooses the Jewish one and completely ignores the Roman one. Oh, I think he didn't mean conflicting with the New Testament. I think he meant conflicting with the, uh, the Talmud, excuse me. Unlike Pilate, who emphasizes the political part of the charge against Jesus, our Bavli author adopts and interprets the version of the trial before the Sanhedrin, combining it with the Mishnaic law. The accusation and condemnation of a blasphemer and an adulterer who leads astray all of Israel. So if I'm not mistaken, let's back up our video on Lofton. Because I'm pretty sure Lofton was like, well, Jesus was an adulterer. Yeah, because you're Catholic, Lofton. But that's not the Jewish perspective, dude. Of course, already being stoned, but okay. Incited people to idol worship. Um, I, this doesn't sound like the Jesus of the New Testament, y'all. Because, <laughs> because you believe in our Lord, dude. I don't know how that's so hard to understand. You believe in our Lord, so yes, it is an idol worship because it's not. But but they are blaspheming our Lord. They're clearly set against our Lord. So to them, what our Lord did is adultery. Like, how is he not putting two and two together, my brother? I I'm sorry, but this is just a refusal to see the truth. This is this is squaring the circle. <sighs> We're going to go on. So th this is so hard to make it through, guys. But I, I thank you for bearing with me. So, um, Mishnaic Law, the accusation condemnation of a blasphemer and adulterer who leads astray all of Israel— we, the Jews, he argues, have put him on trial and executed him for what he was, a blasphemer who claimed to be God and deserved the capital punishment according to our Jewish law. With the deliberate misreading of the New Testament narrative, um, the Bavli claims Jesus for the Jewish people, but only to fend off once and for all any claim by himself or his followers. Yes, indeed, the Bavli admits Jesus was a Jewish heretic who was quite successful in seducing many of us. But he was taken care of according to the Jewish law, got what he deserved, and that's the end of the story. You know who else said that exact same thing? You know who else said that exact same thing? Ben Shapiro. Let's look at the clip. Let's look at the clip together. Ben Shapiro says the exact same thing. Jewish point of view, we don't believe in the Jewish point of view, we don't believe in the divinity of Christ. I right. think that the, there you can make an argument that the 
the Gospels, which were written. He was just a signif- prophet. And, right? signif- no, no, no. We don't I even believe he was a prophet. What do you think he was? What do you guys I, think I, I mean, I, what, I, what do I think he was historically? I think he was a Jew who tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for his trouble, just like a lot of other Jews at that time who were crucified mm. for trying to lead revolts against the Romans and got killed for their trouble. So he became legend and story, and it became a bigger and bigger deal as time yeah, went on. Yeah, he had a group of followers, and then mm. that gradually grew, and then there was Do you think he was, was resurrected? A, no, that's not that's not a, a Jewish belief. Okay, I just want to check. Yeah, no, we're we're not into <laughs> <laughs> you're not we're into not the zombies? miracle stories. No, that's that's no? not. No, you don't have any miracles. No, not 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 by Jesus. Right? No? There there ones the in the God Old Testament. Ones? Yeah, you've got Moses splitting the sea and all that. What do you think happened there? What do I think happened there? Yeah. Well, I'll go with the Maimonidean explanation that there was. A, I mean, it says in the Bible there was a strong east wind. Uh, so there is a naturalistic explanation for a physical phenomenon. Who believes? In the Old Testament. Who believes in the Old Testament? Right? Just from that clip. I believe that Moses parted the Red Sea. That's what I believe as a Christian. I believe that actually happened. I don't believe there was a naturalistic explanation. I don't believe it was just a nice day where, where you know, things just happen to all line up so that he could, he could, you know, cross out of Egypt. Him and the Israelites. My father, Moses. The prophet Moses, the holy prophet Moses, who is in heaven right down, right right now, smiling down on us. I believe Moses actually did that miracle because God actually did that miracle. I don't believe in some naturalistic explanation. I don't believe, you know, it, it, there was a strong east wind. I believe God actually parted the Red Sea. And Moses was a part of that. We inherit the New Testament. David... Abraham, Isaac, Moses, those are our fathers in faith. Because what does Jesus say say to the Pharisees? If you believed in Abraham, or if you believe... Hold on. Just confirming. Yes. John 5, verse 46 to 47. For if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe in his writings, how how will you believe in my words? So Ben admits that he doesn't believe in the words of the prophet Moses. He admits that. Straight up. But I do. I believe in Moses' words. I believe in, in you know, Isaiah's words. I believe in Abraham's words. Because they're my father's. Who's, who's Ben's fathers? He doesn't believe the Holy Prophet Moses. I believe the Holy Prophet Moses. And I believe that he wrote about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do we believe in this? Is this what we believe in? Because I don't believe in that. That's a collection of books written by men who are who are long gone. I don't believe in a, I don't believe in some random collection of texts of men who had no authority to speak on the things of God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that truth is a person who came incarnate to save me from my sins. That's what I believe. And I believe if the words of the people who spoke about him, my holy father, my the holy prophet Moses. I believe David's words. I believe in the words of Abraham. I believe in the words of Isaiah. That's who I believe. But Ben, no, he doesn't believe in that. Strong east wind, by the way, right? Strong east wind, yeah. Parting the Red Sea, according to Ben, never actually happened. It was just a nice, nice coinky dink, right? That, that, you know, all of Israel was brought out of the hands of Egypt. And this goes back to our Lord's words. If you believed in the words of Moses, you would believe in me. Well, Ben doesn't believe in the words of Moses, so clearly he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the words of Moses. That's my book. Old Testament, those are my books. Those are Catholic books. Because we are the new Israel. We are the fulfillment of our father's hopes and dreams and prophecies. We are the fulfillment of the dreams of Daniel and the prophecies 
in the Psalms of David. We are those inheritors. We are their children. Not this religion that has nothing to do with them. This religion is alien to the Old Testament, as far as I'm concerned. It, do it doesn't have any relation to it. And what, what, ha what have we read? There's a, the, uh, you know, contra Lofton here, contra what Lofton has to say, the reason that they don't rec recount, the reason they don't recount the exact happening of the crucifixion is because, you know, Bobley wanted Jesus to be punished according to the Jewish law, to just underscore the hatred and resentment that this religion has towards our Lord. It is so hateful towards our Lord that it would, it would distort what had happened in the New Testament in order to just underscore how much they wanted our Lord to be punished. That's a disgusting thing, quite frankly. That's something that disgusts me and is evil and wrong. And I condemn it. That is not right. But, you know, we've got Lofton running cover for the Talmud over um, here. Inside the people to idol worship, practice sorcery, was stoned, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his own. And path. I don't hate Michael, and I don't hate anybody. I, I, I pray for every single human being, but no, I'm not running the, I'm not running cover for the Talmud. And the court did not find a reason to acquit him, and so they stoned him and hung his corpse on Passover Eve. So we're starting to see some points of disconnect. We're starting to see some. Okay, this Jesus of Nazarene is described as an idolater, a sorcerer, uh, who is also stoned. All right, well, let's continue. Uh, here is from St. Hedra 43a as well. Apropos the trial of Jesus, the Gemara cites another writer where these sages taught Jesus the Nazarene had five disciples. Well, last I checked, Jesus had way more than five disciples. I mean, he had 12 apostles and way more disciples than that. So five disciples? Where's this coming from? Matai, Nakai, Netzer, Buni, and Toda. I don't know. It just doesn't sound like the Jesus of the New Testament that I'm familiar with. Um... They brought Matai in to stand trial. Matai said to the judges, shall Matai be executed? But it, it, isn't it written, when Matai shall I come and appear before God? And so on. It, it describes um, this in a little bit more detail. But just, again, notice the point that it references this Jesus of Na the Nazarene having five disciples, and the names don't really connect. I know some people try to read into the name. We're on the five disciples verse. The story about Jesus's five disciples, chapter seven, continues such charges. In contrast with the futile exercises of most scholars to find here some dark reminiscences of Jesus' historical disciples, I read the story as a highly sophisticated battle with bi biblical verses and a battle between the rabbis and their Christian opponents, challenging the Christian claim that he is the Messiah and son of God, that he was resurrected after his horrible death and that this death is a culmination of the renewed covenant or of the new covenant. Sorry. Hence, as we shall see this story, instead of adding just a b another bizarre facet to the fantastic rabbinic stories about Jesus is nothing short of an elaborate theological discourse to foreshadow the disputations between Jews and Christians, in the medieval ages. Boom. Again, Lofton didn't do his homework. This is, this is in the introduction we didn't even go to chapter seven yet. And this is in the introduction. And, and again, Schaefer remarks, what Lofton doesn't understand is them getting facts wrong. It has a cer certain, as Schaefer is saying, a rhetorical advantage, right? It has a rhetorical advantage of basically being like, look how Christianity is false. Look how we're right. It, it, it's, like if, it, it's like if Michael Lofton tried to claim that the Talmud that, that that the that the story recounting the rabbi correcting God couldn't be in the Talmud because um you know God is omnipotent and omnipresent. Lofton, that's exactly the point. It's trying to underscore their idolatry of of the man made law, the law made by men, the law that's not of Moses, not of not of God the Father, but their own creation. How does he not get this? It's like he did zero research in this entire episode. Names, and they don't see these as actual names. They see them as meaning. I, I get it. I understand that. 
Also, five disciples, though. That's the, there's a point of disconnect. Okay, let, let's continue. Um, now, <clears throat> this is coming from Sota 47a. One day, Rabbi uh, Yehoshua ben Pariah was reciting Shema when Jesus came before him. He intended to accept him on this occasion, so he, he singled or signaled to him with his hand to wait. Uh, Jesus thought he was rejecting him entirely. He therefore went and stood up a brick and worshipped it as an idol. Jesus worshipped a brick as an idol. I've never heard of any stories of uh, the Jesus of the New Testament worshipping a brick as an idol. Uh, Rabbi said to him, return from your sins. Jesus said to him, this is the tradition that I received from you. Anyone who sins and causes the masses to sin is not given the opportunity to repent. The Gemara explains how he caused the masses to sin. But the master said, Jesus the Nazarene performed sorcery, and he incited the masses and subverted the masses and caused the Jewish people to sin. So we're seeing a theme here, right? We're seeing this Jesus the Nazarene is often described as a sorcerer and an idolater with five disciples. Yep. And you know who, you know what Catholic apologists had the cojones to admit that this is what the Talmud teaches? Let me find it. Let me find it real quick. Gary Machuda, Hostile Witnesses. We're going to read this. Hostile Witnesses. The book is written all about how... All about how even the worst enemies of the church wind up giving witness to... The claims of Christianity to the claims of our Lord, and 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 Gary had enough courage to even talk about the Talmud and the Mishnah. I I believe the or actually I don't know if uh, not the Mishnah. I believe the Midrash, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pulling up the book right now. Rabbinical sources: the Mishnah and the Talmud. And the book is called Hostile Witnesses, uh, How the Historical Enemies of the Church Prove Christianity. So here he's going to talk about the Mishnah and the Tal Talmud. So it was the Mishnah, not the Midrash, excuse me. Just prior to Second Jewish Revolt, the oral tradition of the Pharisees was set in writing for the first time in history. The enterprise took place under the auspices of Rabbi Akiba, uh, Akiba ben Joseph and the fin finalized by Judah the Prince. This layer of tradition is known as the Mishnah. There also are very various comments and commentaries made on the Mishnah called the Gemara. The combination of the Mishnah and the Gemara make up the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. It is important to remember that rabbinical literature, although it contains much historical information, wasn't written to teach history. Its purpose is to instruct. For this reason, rabbinical material tolerates inconsistencies and even outright contradictions as long as the message is conveyed. Lofton. Buddy, take notes here, okay? Let's let's be writing some notes down. So even Gary Machuda has the cojones to say it's not about teaching history. It's about a certain rhetorical message. Since our approach in this book focuses on the message conveyed along with the underlying assumptions and implications, rabbinical literature is well suited for our inquiry. And this is a fantastic book, by the way. You guys should all get this. It's a beautiful book. It will really, really, really help your faith. So the testimony. So this he's quoting the Talmud as we've read. On the eve of Passover, Yeshu was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward to his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. And if we remember, Nicomedes, holy Saint Nicomedes, condemned the trial of our Lord before the Pharisees because it wasn't even a legal trial. They did an illegal trial in the middle of the night to condemn our Lord Jesus Christ. If we remember the Holy Gospels, This tradition from the Babylonian Talmud comes from the uh, Tanakhic uh, uh, period. 
uh, which places it within our period of study. Sanhedrin 43a has points of continuity and discontinuity with the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John. For example, Jesus was hung on a tree on the eve of Passover. This is consistent with the Gospel of John, specifically verses John 13, uh, 1, 18, 28, and 19, 14. Sanhedrin also mentions stoning, which differs from the Gospels. John records several instances where the Jewish leaders threatened Jesus with stoning, as, as these verses lay above from the Holy Gospel of John. But all of these took place well before Good Friday. It should be noted that Sanhedrin's reference to stoning places it at odds not only with Christian sources, but with itself. Sanhedrin 43a begins and ends by stating that Yeshu, the Nazarene, was hanged on Passover Eve. The crier's message about stoning contradicts these assertions. Hostile Witnesses In terms of direct evidence, Sanhedrin 43a confirms that Jesus was a real person, that he performed miraculous feats, and that he was executed on a specific time, Passover Eve, and by specific method, being hung or crucified. The author of this text clearly assumed that he was commenting on actual events and not, as the mythicists claim, an amalgamation of quasi-pagan folklore. The most striking feature of Sanhedrin 43a is that it confirms, albeit in a pre uh, prejudicial way, that Jesus worked miracles. According to the text, he, Jesus, practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Like the hostile witnesses in the gospel, Sanhedrin doesn't deny that Jesus worked miracles. What is disputed is whether these deeds are demonstrated that Jesus claimed to be in the Messiah, uh, claimed to be in the Messiah and the Son of God. The Pharisees in the Gospels charge Jesus with driving out demons by the power of the Prince of Demons. Sanhedrin 43a does something similar when it assigns the source of miraculous power to sorcery. Jesus' followers would also suffer the same calumny. Matthew 10:25. Deuterocanon is scripture. So it, go, it goes on. It talks about, uh, Gary talks about how, uh, oh, I think I just, oh, where did, ah, here we go. Sorry. My scroll wheel's a little off. Uh, so it goes on to how it talks about the Deuterocanon being scripture and stuff like that. But, but we have a couple other um, hostile witnesses from this evidence too. So I won't read the Deuterocanon section, but it proves the Deuterocanon being part of scripture, right? Another testimony. These are they who do not share in the world to come, who say there is no resurrection of the dead and that, that the law is not from heaven. And the uh, Eubacarians are Akiba adds, he who reads the external books and he who whispers over wounds saying all sickness, which I brought into Egypt, I will not bring upon thee. Uh, Tosefta Sanhedrin uh, 12 one to seven excludes from the next life those who deny the resurrection of the body and an inscription of, of the Torah. Rabbi Akiba adds two items to the list of disqualifications from the afterlife, reading the external books um, and oddly enough, whispering Exodus 1526 over a wound. The prohibition from reading the external book seems to be pretty straightforward. In fact, uh, quoted above shows Akiba would have included uh, in Christian scripture among the external books. Uh, what is this prohibition against whispering a verse over a wound? Um, let's see here. Rabbinical literature prohibits anyone from attempting to heal oneself with the words of the Torah. But why single out this verse include it with a prohibition from reading the external books? Exodus 15.26 doesn't seem to contain anything offensive. It reads, if you really listen to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you heed his commandments and keep all his precepts, I will not afflict you with any of the diseases with which I afflict the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your healer. Why single out this verse, right? An answer may be found in the last three Hebrew words I've translated. I am the Lord, your healer. Hebrew, like many other ancient languages, assigns numeric values to letters. For example, Latin assigns the value one to uh, uh, one five or uh, to to I five to V and ten to X and so on. Um, letters can be combined in different ways to give different values. Uh, for for example, the number eleven could be uh, XI, which stands for X, uh, where X stands for ten, um, and I stands for one. Ten plus one equals eleven. 
What this means is that the words can have numeric values, even if the author never intended to give them a number. The Jews understood the phenomenon and had different ways of calculating their values. Why is this important? The numerical value of the last three words in Exodus 15.26 comes to 391.76. It just so happens that 391 is the numerical value for the name Jesus, Yeshua. Since Christians performed healings and exorcisms by invoking Jesus' name, could it be that Christians use this verse as a cryptic way to invoke the name of Jesus in order to heal a wound? All the pieces of this puzzle seem to fit except one. Why not just pronounce Yeshua over the wound? Why such cryptic method? Christian sources tell, Christian sources tell us that the signs and wonders accompanied by the preaching, preaching of the gospel, which led to waves of conversions to Christianity. These conversions weren't a problem only for paganism, but for Judaism as well. The New Testament speaks of the efforts that were made to suppress the name of Jesus in, in Acts. Uh, Sanhedrin 12 verses 1 to 7 suggests that, that measures were taken to prevent Christians from healing Jews by using his name. Invoking Exodus 15.26 may have been a way for Christians to sidestep these countermeasures, at least for a time. Eventually, it was discovered, and Akiba suppressed this practice as well. So they're suppressing Christian uh, practices because they 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 don't love our they they disdain our Lord that much. That's crazy. It just goes back to what we've said, right? We're almost we're almost uh, to the end of this, right? Another testimony: the grandson of our. Uh, Je uh, Je uh, Jeho uh, Jeho uh, Jehoshua ben Levi had something struck in, stuck in his throat. There came a man and whispered to him in the name of uh, Jeshu Pandera, and he and he recovered. When he the doctor came out, he our uh, Jehoshua said to him, "What didst thou whisper to him?" He came to him a certain word. He said it had been better for him that uh, he had died rather than thus. And it, it happened thus to him, as it were an error that proceedeth from the ruler. Rabbi Jeshua ben Levi lived in the third Christian century. The healer is not named, but he apparently is a Christian since he whispered the name Jeshu Pandera to cure an affliction. Jeshu Pandera is one of the several names given to Jesus in rabbinical literature. Rabbi Jeshua ben Levi thought it, it better that his grandson should die rather than to be healed by his, this name. The quote from Ecclesiastes 10.5 says, Error that proceedeth from the ruler seems to mean that once a deplorable evil has been committed, um, uh, it cannot be taken back. Therefore, the grandson's healing in the name of Jesus has occurred and the damage cannot un be undone. The point of the lesson is obvious. It is better to die than to be healed by the name of Jesus. So the Talmud teaches that it's better to die than to be healed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hostile witnesses testify to a few facts. First, Christian healings really did occur among the Jews. Second, Christians healed simply by pronouncing the name of Jesus over a wound. Second case, a choking victim was healed by the sacred name. Unlike with other hostile witnesses, there is no attempt here to interpret how the healing occurred. It is treated as a brute fact. Third, the very existence of this lesson shows that Christian healings must have been fairly common. Otherwise, there would be no need to exhort the Jews to resist Christian healers, even at the cost of their lives. Such resistance res serves to underscore how great of a threat Christian healings are the name of Jesus were uh, perceived to be the Jewish leaders at the time. And we have our th uh, we have our third, or actually I believe now our fourth witness, even from the Talmud. People are not to sell anything to Gentiles or to buy from them, and they do not seek assistance from them, either financial or medical assistance. There was the case of R. Elizar de Dama, uh, B. Dama, who was bitten by a snake. Jacob of Kephar Sama came to heal him in the name of Jesus, son of uh, Pantera. Our Ishmael did not allow him to accept the healing. They said to him, You are not permitted to accept healing from him, Ben Dama. He said to him, I shall bring forth uh, you proof in the form of a verse of scripture from the Torah that he may indeed heal me. But he did not have a chance to bring forth proof before he dropped dead. Said our Ishmael, Happy are you, Ben Dama, for your body is pure and your soul has not gone forth in purity. Uh, you have expired in peace. 
but you did not break the, down the hedge erected by sages. For whoever breaks down the hedge erected by sages eventually suffers punishment. As it is said, he who breaks down a hedge is bitten by the snake. Ecclesiastes 10.8 it's difficult to pinpoint the exact date of which, uh, when this occurred. Jacob of Kephar Sama was a contemporary of Ishmael, who lived approximately two generations after the time of Jesus. The Ben Dama incident is recounted as part of the general prohibition against accepting assistance from Gentiles, especially, it seems, from Christians. The story is very similar to the healing of R. Uh, Jehoshua, Ben Levi's grandson. Only in the instance, the Christian was successfully prevented from healing Ben Dama. So the hostile witness. The warning in this passage is a bit stronger than the passage mentioned previously, since Eleazar ben Dama died from his affliction. But the basic lesson is the same. It is more blessed to die obeying the prohibition of the rabbis to be healed in the name of Jesus. What's astounding about this passage is that the author assumes that ben Dama would have been healed had Jacob invoked Jesus' name. So they admit Jesus would have healed this man. That's insane. This is a significant ad admission, since it applies that such healings occurred frequently enough to warrant a specific prohibition. Rabbi Ishmael's words concluding are also very important. For you expired in peace, but you did not break down the hedge erected by the sages. The hedge erected by the sages refers to the rabbinical legislation that prohibits any action that comes close to breaking the law. This indicates that by the time of Rabbi Ishmael, Official action had already been taken place to prevent Christian healings. Why erect this hedge if there wasn't a pressing need? Conclu the conclusion by Gary Machuda says this, The value of Jewish hostile testimony cannot be overstated. The Jews undoubt undoubtedly had no desire to affirm anything positive about Jesus or Christianity. Yet Jewish sources indirectly, indirectly confirm Several facts about Jesus' life and death, namely that he worked miracles, Josephus, Sanhedrin, and it was crucified, Josephus, the Sanhedrin, under Pontius Pilate, Josephus, on Passover Eve, Sanhedrin. All the host Jewish hostile witnesses held Jesus to have been a real person, and the idea that he was quasi-fictional uh, quasi fictional, uh, amalgam of uh, pagan mythical figures was foreign to their thought. Probably the most interesting thing about these hostile testimonies is their affirmation of Christian miracles. Our earliest extra-biblical uh, Jewish witness, Josephus, affirms that Jesus was a wise man who worked startling deeds. Rabbinical literature echo echoes the New Testament enemies, conceding that he worked wondrous deeds, but disputing the source of them. In the New Testament, Jesus' enemies accused him of performing miracles by the power of the devil. Rabbinical literature identified the source of this power as magic or sorcery. As we will see in the next part, the pagan philosophers Celsus and, uh, you know, talks about the pagan philosophers. The miraculous character of Christianity and the waves of, of converts it inspired were seen as a threat by Jewish and pagan leaders alike. As we saw with Tacitus and Pliny, pagan rulers resorted to suppression and persecution to put down the Christian movement. The rabbinical leadership relied on the uh, Tosefta Tracte Ulin, uh, 20, uh, 222 to 4, called A Hedge Erected by Sages, a program of resistance to Christian healings. Together, the pagan and Jewish reactions to Christian miracles uh, show somehow that the miracles really did take place. So we have just confirmed everything contra Lofton that, in fact, this is talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This isn't talking about someone else. This isn't talking about you know, some other figure or some other person named Jesus. This is talking about our sacred Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Enthusiasta posted in chat, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13. Absolutely. And even the Talmud and its blasphemies seems to admit that. Or rather, that every everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ, the Almighty, shall be healed. But they prohibit that because to them, it's that's blasphemy. All right. Well, let's continue. Let's now look at Sanhedrin 67a. How does the court do this to him? The agents of the court light a candle for him in an inner room. and they... I think, quite frankly, we've, we've shown sufficiently that, in fact, Jesus is ta talked about in the Talmud contra Lofton. And I, I think he's just, for the rest of this video, going to try and cite verses Right, Pandera, you know, Pandera, 
right? Who they call our mother Mary Pandera. And what did we read from the Gary Machuda, right? Saying, you know, these people were being healed in the name of, yeah, uh, uh, I can't remember the the name that they changed our Lord's name to, but essentially Jesus, the son of Pandera, right? So he he's just wrong. Lofton didn't do his homework on this. If he had even read Gary Machuda's book, he probably would have even been more well off, but he didn't read Gary Machuda's book and he didn't read Peter Schaefer's book. Who Peter Schaefer is not just some random anti, you know, he's not a random anti-Semite or anything like that. He is a scholar at Princeton University, or at least Princeton University publishes text. I'm not sure if he is actually a scholar who works at Princeton. But we've we've just disproven. I, this was actually easier than I thought. I thought I thought we were really going to get into the nitty gritty. No, it's like Lofton didn't do any of his homework. And we, we just scratched the surface with this book. Scratched the surface. We didn't even fully get into everything. So I, I'm just, I, I'm blown away. Let me, got, let, let me know what you guys think in chat, but I'm just blown away. I mean, th this is just so unbelievably wrong. I'm amazed that he would defend this. What is the point of the Talmud other than to turn well-meaning Hebrews away from the God of the New and the Old Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because it's a worship of the law. It's not a worship of, of God. It's not a worship of Almighty God. God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I got the order wrong. Well, uh, you know what I mean. It, 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 it's turning away the Jews in order to worship someone else and that person is not jesus that person is not the person of jesus christ my lord and my god and my savior the father the son and the holy spirit i just can't believe he defended this skits and skist said I just got here. Going to have to watch the whole replay. Absolutely. This was a good episode. And hopefully YouTube takes it down. I'll just upload it to uh, Rumble. You guys will be able to see it. I'll also ra uh, upload the old Rumble streams too. I'm just amazed. I just don't get why people would do that. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't get why people would... Um, try to believe in something contrary to what we know the truth is. I'm just amazed at that. It's like a Franciscan order that's with the SSPX, huh? What the heck? What is, is this like Tom McDonald or something? Dating a trans girl, what the heck, man? Kyle Rittenhouse. Is this... Is, is this it a... different dating a trans girl? Well, this is the first relationship I've ever had with a trans girl. But the differences that I've noticed are... Are... Hmm. The penis. That's the difference. The penis. <laughs> oh, uh... I'm dropping a brand new music video this Friday at 9 a.m. Okay, Tom McDonald, kind of a Tom McDonald W, just like calling it as it is. But Tom, you also had Blair White dance in one of your music videos, bro. Don't think we haven't forgotten about that, dog. Don't 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 think we've we haven't forgotten about that, bro. You you made a you made a music video with Ben Shapiro and and Blair White was in one of your music videos. Also, his name's not Blair. His name's Bob, by the way. His name's Robert. You had Robert White dancing in your video, bro. It's like, come on, man. Either take the video down and and say that like you you condemn that stuff, or I'm not gonna believe any serious like, um, you know, serious condemnation. That kind of stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm still at 1.5. I was like, why is why is T Dam being chanted so fast?
say something like on a more positive note? Do you guys ever just see things like this and you're like, I'm so happy I'm Catholic. Like, like I, I, I love being Catholic. Like it's just such a little joy, but it's like, I, I look at things like this and I'm like, I'm so happy that I'm Catholic. Like, like this is just so beautiful. I, we're so lucky to have like the liturgy. We are so lucky to have the mass and even just, 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 you know, external elements like, like the chant T Deum or, or just, you know, beautiful little liturgical traditions that we have. Like our faith really is beautiful. I love being Catholic, bro. This is, this is gorgeous. I hope, I hope when I go to Rome this March, like I get to experience a liturgy like this or just so, just so beautiful. And I don't know if I told you guys, I don't know how I'm going to be able to contain myself saying this. I'm going to get to assist at mass on the, on the, um, um, altar where St. John Paul II is buried. On the tomb. Sorry, I was looking for the word. I will get to help serve mass on the tomb, the altar of St. Sebastian. And I don't know how I'm going to be able to contain myself. I just, that, that is, that is going to blow me away. I, I just, I, I don't even. I don't even have words. I, I I I really do think that this trip's just gonna change my life, dude. I, I, I really I, I'm so I'm so just just I'm so excited. You know. I even want to see if we can find a video actually of the altar of Saint Sebastian. April 2nd was the 8th anniversary of the death of John Paul II. To mark it, Pope Francis visited his tomb at 7 p.m. that day. Soon after, St. Peter's Basilica closed off to tourists. The Pope approached the chapel along with Cardinal Comastri, Archpriest of the Basilica, and his personal secretary, Alfred Schweden. The Pope knelt and prayed in silence. Afterward, he did the same for the tombs of Blessed John XXIII and St. Pius X. The visit rounded out the one the Pope did on Monday to the excavations under the Vatican that allowed him to be closer to the remains of St. Peter. A guide explained to him step by step the evolution of the archaeological investigations done during the 20th century. During the special visit, the Pope walked all along the uncovered archaeological remains before going to St. Peter's tomb. I can't wait. That's going to be incredible. Sorry, I'm not trying to get so, uh, I always get choked. You guys know me. I'm, I'm a big old, old, big old sappy guy, but I just, I, 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 I don't know. I really just hope it's life changing. You know what I mean? I, 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 I don't, I don't know how it's going to change my life, but I have a feeling, you know? pine sappy said david david miller said pine sappy so true dude i am i just am a sappy guy pray the lord gets you through thank you brother i will this is too glorious for a friday of lent i know dude we had such a treat the duck said being catholic is the best absolutely it is man it's it's just it's so powerful like being catholic is everything there there's nothing you know there was that guy the other day that was saying, you know, to Beardson, well, stop, t stop talking about Catholicism. Stop talking about Catholicism so much. That's don't talk about Catholicism. As far as I'm concerned, that's the only thing I want to talk about for the rest of my life. Bluntly put, 
everything else is like piecemeal compared to the Catholic faith. Everything else is secondary. Catholicism is everything that matters. And I don't want to talk about anything other than Catholicism. I, I only want to talk about the Catholic faith. I only want to be focused on Catholicism. I don't want to be focused on anything else. It just matters so much. Sorry, I was trying to find a cool Constantine the Great video to watch with you guys. I think actually the Eastern Orthodox made uh, a really cool video on him um, that actually would be um, that it would actually be really good for us to watch together. Because I mean, it's Eastern Orthodox, but frankly, everything that they say is Catholic and stuff like that. So there's no there's no reason why we shouldn't uh, enjoy the video. It's like a cool documentary on him. I also can't believe they reconstructed his Colossus. It's now in Rome. I hope to see it when I'm there. Sorry. Gotta blow out the dust, man. I think I found it. Yeah, dude, we found it. Okay, we're we're so back. We're so back right now. I had to go through my telegram because um, I had had it a long time ago. That is the mindset of a saint or martyr. These people truly gave up, up all for the faith. Absolutely. Um, Anton asks, speaking of EO, did you hear about Greece? Yes, please pray for Greece. I hope that horrible law and sodomy is overturned. Um you have the infographic of the extra biblical sources of the historicity of Jesus. I believe I do, if I'm not mistaken. Why, uh, bro, why does Robert Sengenis insist that the church is wrong about Galileo? Um, I would have to investigate his work. I know that uh, Mr. Robert Sengenis holds to geocentrism. I, I, I haven't investigated enough about that. Uh, I'm horrible when it comes to science stuff. Like I'm a young earth creationist, for instance, but like if someone asked me like defend young earth creationism, I would just have to point them to the other people who defend it better, way better than I do. Like, uh, like Gideon Lazar, our friend Byzantine Scotist. Uh, Bra uh, Brosmian said, I will only talk about Christ's bride. Thank you very much. Absolutely, brother. I'm with you on that. Okay, can I just can I just say a minor thing that I really really love and enjoy that I that 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 this is like something that just sweetens life a little bit more for me. I love this early 2000s late 90s EWTN style like presentation. Like when they would make like documentaries on like EWTN and it's like the the cool intro and it's got like the grand music and the in the cool like music samples and stuff like that and like imagery that was like generated maybe by like an early computer like i love those documentaries like like i love those episodes documentaries whatever they are it's such a little thing that people don't pay attention to i do though i love it to death like you're telling me like this isn't awesome like this pre and i know it's an ortho thing but like it's it's just a great style of presentation like who who wouldn't look at this and be like, this is cool, man. 
the way to remember St. Constantine is a little bit tricky, bearing the same name. Uh, he's not somebody that I've always thought of in terms of a patron saint that I address prayers to as I feel closer perhaps to some other saints. I bear the name Constantine. He's my patron saint. But I have to be honest with you. This is not a saint to whom I would go in my private devotions and say, Saint Constantine, please pray for me, or please intercede for me in this particular way. I couldn't identify with the man. In earlier years, I was always hearing about the imperial things, and, and I let that kind of taint my impression of him. But as I look at it now from, from where I am, I feel more awe and more respect for, for him. I began to really do some soul searching and really read into his life. I feel more awe for him because I understand better the trappings of the world and how sometimes uh, we try not to compromise, but we have to, do, we have to make some accommodations for things around us. We can't always have things the way that we want them. The church acknowledges genuine human struggle. Constantine was a real human being and he struggled. If I were trying to look at him. For okay, awesome quote. Awesome quote. You know, I, I, I know, um, I know, unfortunately, father is not reconciled with the Catholic Church. He should do that. But like Constantine was a real human being. Can we just get that in chat? Constantine, real human being. I, I listen, I, I will agree with that fully 100%. Constantine, St. Constantine, the great real human being. He was a real human being, bro. I mean, he literally helped. He literally helped convoke the ecumenical council of nicaea right he helped defend orthodox you know the catholic faith right the orthodox catholic faith throughout the empire he was a real human being dude he, he like irish owl said it in chat he literally is me bro like like forget ryan gosling get over here i i i don't you're you know get pushed over there there's a new sheriff in town and it's saint constantine bro there's a new literally me character in town, and it's St. Constantine. From the point of view of a 20 or 21st century Christian, I would have to be very critical. But if I understand things in the milieu that they come from, everything is a lot different. And I can understand that quite a bit better now than I could have earlier in my life. To understand the life of St. Constantine, we have to uh, get a grasp on... Uh, the times in which he was born. Uh, these were barbaric times. We're talking about Pax Romana, Roman peace, but how was Roman peace instilled? It was instilled with the sword. So we're talking about invasions, war, intrigue, that sort of thing. And these were cruel times, and this is the world into which Constantine was born. Saint Constantine, the great and equal to the apostles, was born in 271. His father, Flavius, Blissful friend just said in chat, this presentation style needs to come back. Like, I want to hear more saint biographies in this presentation style. By the way, actually, we're going to come back to this. We're not going anywhere. You guys need to get this. And you can get it through registering on your parish for absolutely free. I don't pay. I pay $0 a month for this. Get formed. Formed is literally Catholic Netflix, unironically. I mean, literally, literally introducing the new formed the Catholic faith on demand. You can find so many good documentaries, so many good films on this app. I highly recommend it. You can download it on your TV. You can download it on your phone. You should get this and check with your parish. Your parish should have a formed account that you can register through your parish and get literally just free Catholic content. Like, like you want to avoid like the de degeneracy of like Netflix and stuff like that. You want just like good Catholic content, get formed. I'm not being paid to say that, by the way. I just, I love Formed so much. Like, I watched um, Stephen, Stephen Ray's, I think it's Footprints of God on Formed. W series, dude. I mean, it literally is this presentation style all the way through. He talks about our Lord, talks about the prophet Moses, and, and I believe Isaiah, and uh, the early Christians. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. So good. He's a military dude. tribune. And like all soldiers... He went from one battlefield to the next. At one town that he came, his soldiers pitched their tents. But always the leaders of the 
where the generals or the officers would uh, rest and sleep at the inn. And as was typical in those days, he uh, not only sought lodging and food, but a young lady to keep him warm. Now the innkeeper, seeing the man was of rank, decided that he was going to offer Flavius his young daughter, Helen, with the time of 16. And that night, Flavius sleeps with Helen. Upon leaving the inn the next day, Flavius left behind one of his garments with his initials engraved in it and some money for the innkeeper that in case the young lady became pregnant or there was difficulties, she would be taken care of. She did indeed become pregnant uh, and would give birth to a child who would be named Constantine, who would indeed become Constantine the Great, or as we know him, Saint Constantine. However, for the next several years, uh, there is no father to be had. Uh, Flavius Constantine is gone, has not returned to check up on things, nor does he probably even know he has a son. So Helen raised him on her own, basically, a single mother, something that a lot of women in our situation here in America, our country, our time, now have to deal with also. Constantine, in essence, comes from a single parent family. For 10 years, Helen, as a young teenager, and then as a young woman, raises the child, Constantine, by herself. Eventually, Flavius is elevated and becomes now not military tribune, but a military governor, and is sent to the area where Helen and her father and Constantine live. The issue is, how does this, uh, this daughter of an innkeeper now go to a military tribune of high rank and say, oh, by the way, I have your child. This is your son. Just didn't happen. St. Helen, as many women would have liked to do, would have really gained much by going and informing this man that he had a son, but she didn't do that. It was her nature, it was her love for her child that only focused on the raising of this child and not on the power that he could have. While the governors in town, the soldiers have their horses by the inn, young Constantine, nine years old, is out playing with the horses. The soldiers became angry and began to beat Constantine. Helen hears the commotion, comes running out, attempts to stop them. She cries out, stop, don't hit my son. He is the governor's child. I'm sure the reaction was, you and who else? She ran into the house and retrieved the robe that Flavius had given her with his initials on it when he was the military tribune of the area. Helen does what any good... Um, Rob Donk, 22, <laughs> that name's funny, just asked Pinesep, I've been uh, listening to you a lot recently. I'm not Catholic, but I'm trying to find the true church. Any recommendations uh, for someone to see the arguments from for Catholicism? Well, real quick in chat, my brother, I will answer that. Tell me what background you come from. If you are, if you are from um, a, a evangelical background, please tell me you're an Eastern Orthodox background. Please tell me you're an atheist and I will give you book recommendations according to that. Excuse me. Sorry. Everyone saying in chat, some awesome comments. Constantine discovered his true father eventually. Thanks be to God. Absolutely, dude. That's awesome. Constantine, OG Catholic integralist. That's what I'm saying, dude. He literally was the OG Catholic integralist. And I can't remember, was Theodosius, was the, Theodosius the Great Constantine's grandson? Or... Half a century later. What was his relation to Constantine? Was he he Constantine's son, if I'm not mistaken? Or was there a new dynasty, if I'm remembering correctly? Was he related to him? I, I can't remember. Hmm. Or did he not have any relation to him? Maybe someone knows in chat.
Hmm. I guess I was wrong. I thought he was like the grandson or something. That's that's my mistake, gentlemen. I sometimes forget how. It, it, okay, it's a new dynasty. Patrick Royper said, "Gotcha." I'm sorry about that. I I totally forgot. Um, do I think Baldwin the fourth should be a saint? Uh, Uchenna uh, uh, Nuoga said. Um, yeah, I could see I could see precedent for that. Baldwin the fourth was a wonderful king and 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 d definitely a strong believer in Jesus Christ. So I could see him being a saint. Loving mom would do to protect her son, and she basically said, "Don't you know who who her, his daddy is?" <laughs> And they said no. <laughs> so she told them. They didn't believe it. She comes out. Here he is. So the duck said, I'm getting a lamb. What should I call it? Oh, like a pet lamb? Man, what would be a good name? What would be a good biblical name for a lamb? Man, what would be a good... Put some names in chat, guys, if you can think of any. ELCD, ELCA. Um... ELCA, oh wow, ELCA, man. <laughs> Yikes. You had a similar background as I did, Episcopal Church of America. Yeah, you want to talk about some bad stuff. Yikes. ELCA, orthocatechumen, fair weather believer in Jesus. So, um, what I would say is, you know, one of the best books I recommend for people who are coming to the Catholic Church is Why We're Catholic. Um, I think Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn is a fantastic book. Um, it, it's a fantastic just introduction to the faith um, and kind of like the basic reasons for believing uh, our, our, uh, our faith and stuff like that. Why We're Catholic is great. Uh, Carl Adams' Spirit of Catholicism. The Spirit of Catholicism is a fantastic, probably one of the best introductions to Catholicism out there. Um and then I'm trying to remember Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton, I think was written when he was still an Anglican. Was Everlasting Man written when he, I think Everlasting Man, Everlasting Man's still a good book. I, I, I would, yeah, I think, I think it was when he, um, See, Orthodoxy and Everlasting Man, both are fantastic books. Everlasting Man, Orthodoxy, and then um, a really, really great ba book for um, understanding the faith. And Spexo, my brother Spexo, told me this changed his life when he read it. Which oh, we need to do Logos Triumphant. I, I keep forgetting we need to we need to do Logos Triumphant soon. Uh, is Apologetics and Catholic Doctrine by Archbishop Michael Sheehan. Archbishop Archbishop Michael Sheehan, this book is like worth its weight in gold. It's a fantastic introduction to the faith, the reasons for believing the faith, j like just kind of a general introduction to like the existence of God, why the Catholic Church is the true church and stuff like that. This book is worth its weight in gold. It is one of my most prized books on the shelf. And if you need really good books from kind of the coming from the ortho background, honestly, I know we criticized him, but Michael Lofton's book on eastern orthodoxy is really good i i really like it i think it's a fantastic introduction to why why is uh why is uh, uh catholicism true versus eastern orthodoxy and james lacutus's books james lacutus is awesome i have like multiple of his books on my shelf um the divine primacy of the bishop of rome beautiful beautiful book uh piecing together uh uh this is his book the divine mosaic i have both of those on my shelf actually i've got the uh, divine primacy on my shelf and uh uh the divine mosaic he debates he or debates he totally debunks michael welton's book pope and patriarchs in that book it's incredible how much he dismantles it um you also have be uh, beautiful testimony to some uh eastern orthodox individuals that converted catholicism Heralds of a Catholic Russia. I also have that on my shelf. And it goes without saying, but Eric Yabara's books. The Papacy is magnificent. Probably one of the best books ever written on the Papacy uh, to date. And uh, The Filioque. 
The Filioque and the Papacy are two fantastic works. You can't go wrong with them. So Eric, Eric, Carl Adam, Archbishop Sheehan, uh, all those, all those books are just fantastic, man. You have brother, you can't go wrong with them. It was the cape and uh, the smirch left the faces of the soldiers. They were shocked and a little bit frightened, taken off base. They took the cloak and presented it to Constantius. Flavius, at this point, he could have easily rejected her and the child. Uh, he chooses not to, however. He does something interesting. He embraces them. He brings them in. As she approached the mansion, of course, she probably was very uncomfortable because being a peasant girl, living a life of poverty, she is now going into luxury, which is a very strange life for her. A man of his stature and class wasn't easy to marry a woman of St. Helen's class, but he does so. Again, she was not prideful and took the position of a secondary type of wife to the governor, even though he did marry her, in order to allow her son to have the great opportunity to be educated and to become something in his life. And for about a 12 to 13 year period, this is how Constantine, Helen, and Flavius live. And then after a while, it becomes evident that Flavius can't keep her around if he wants to go further in his career. Keep in mind now that there were tremendous pressures to come up to the proper status as, as a Caesar. Flavius receives a huge promotion. He becomes Caesar, but part of the deal was to marry the emperor's daughter. So he told Helen, basically, you're no longer useful to me. I need to move up in society. He divorces Helen, and perhaps it was this incident also that uh, sends her on her own spiritual quest, because it was at about this time that she began to seriously consider uh, the deeper meanings of Christianity within her own life. This woman, I mean, again, she's got to be the strongest, the strongest woman because she, she goes on a roller coaster ride in her life. She has nothing. She has everything. She's in. She's out again. But we need to know that here in America these days, we didn't invent divorce, and we didn't invent the pain and the turmoil that come from divorce. Uh, what our church can show us, what Constantine will show us, is how people who are products of divorce don't have to roll over, play dead, give in to their circumstances, and throw away their lives. Flavius at this time could have cast Helen aside totally, and his son. He chose not to do that, however. Um, he has him assigned uh, to the Emperor Diocletian, being part of his imperial guard, close to his mother. Yes, Saint... Uh, I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing Saint Helen's name. Saint Helena, yes. Saint Helena did uh, discover the true cross in Jerusalem when she was on pilgrimage. She was a she was an incredible woman. Saint Helena is is such a beautiful saint. I need to read more about her biography actually, but yes, you are correct about that. And again, it was at this time that Helen begins her conversion. Obviously, this also has a deepening effect on Constantine. When Constantine was with the Imperial Guard, his mind was working. He was observing, he was watching how things get done. At this point, uh, the emperors have to discredit the Christians, and more than just discredit, they have to eliminate them. Nero is commonly referred to as the most ruthless emperor, but these emperors at this time are referred to as equal to Nero, if not more ruthless than Nero, and are really increasing uh, and, and turning up the volume on, on the persecutions of Christians and really killing many times even without inquiry. The problem is what do you do with them? How does one contend with a group of people who, when persecuted, uh, repay with love, uh, who, when tortured, proclaim uh, forgiveness? How does it affect Constantine? For Constantine to see what the Christians suffered, to see them tortured this way, and yet to see their fortitude, their faith, their loyalty to their God must have made an impression upon him. As history would have it, sometimes you know, the cliche that says history repeats itself. Constantine, he married a woman by the name of Minervina, who was not unlike the same type of person or the same status in life as his mother Helena. She was really a commoner. And she becomes pregnant. During childbirth, she gives birth to a healthy baby boy, Crispus. But Minervina dies, which was not, sadly, uncommon during those days. So Constantine has this child with Minervina. She dies. 
he goes off to battle. Helen comes in, the, the grandmother, uh, to take care of the child and raise the child. It just goes to show you that there's nothing new under the sun. But this is the, the story that's played out in millions of homes now and through the ages where the grandparents have to come in. In July of 306, Constantine's father dies, and he is so well loved by his father's army that he's lifted up on their shield, and the imperial purple is clasped around Constantine's shoulders. So he is, in effect, the person who takes his father's place in the empire. After becoming a Caesar, uh, then going through the ranks a little bit more, Constantine marries the emperor's daughter, Fausta, and as a wedding gift to Constantine, he's elevated now to emperor. And so at the age of 34, 35, here we have now Constantine, emperor, and married. Over the next four years as an emperor, Constantine is victorious in numerous battles, many, many battles fought. And uh, the hardest battle is yet to come, though, in Rome, when he will uh, battle the emperor, Maxentius. Constantine came into Rome, and at the great battle known in 312 at Milvian, bridge there the battle took place that changed the course of history but certainly the course of christianity so this is the battle this is now talking about the whole empire we're not talking about a small country we're talking about an entire uh, land an entire uh, kingdom in order to be sole ruler of the empire constantine has to face his brother-in-law maxentius and he does so but maxentius before the battle has consulted with an oracle and the oracle tells him your enemy, the enemy, will be defeated. And that, to be honest, drives Constantine's troops to despair because most of them are not Christian. Constantine's troops are, are dismayed. Uh, they feel like they're going to lose now. Emperor Constantine is off on his own, privately wondering what on earth he can do to motivate these soldiers. What single thing can he do? Is there any way he can turn the tide? And as he's contemplating these things, Emperor Constantine looks up in, in the sky. He sees blazing above the sun the cross and the words, and duto nika, in this conquer. With this, in other words, the cross of Christ, the faith in Christ, conquer. You will be victorious. And so he immediately had the monogram of the cross put on the shields of his uh, troops of his soldiers and he dedicated the battle in the name of Jesus Christ. And so in a sense it's almost a battle between Roman religion and Christianity even though Constantine himself to be honest still doesn't know who Christ really is. So they gather for the battle. It goes badly for Maxentius. He loses. And Constantine enters the city as the sole Roman emperor. Did St. Constantine really see something in the sky? And that something, was it the cross of Christ? Was it the words as well? With this conquer? I tend to believe it. And the reason why is because if Christianity was a mainstream, accepted religion in those days, wouldn't be a problem. But it wasn't. Christians were being persecuted. Christianity was seen as an anti-emperor religious cult which was opposed to the empire. And for him all of a sudden to, to take this symbol and then say, put this on your shields, we're going to win because of this, uh, just flies in the face of all rational thought at that time. For Constantine to order that his soldiers shields bear the cross of Christ, the, the cross of Christianity, of a God who was tortured and humiliated and was crucified, for him to order for that symbol of Christianity, which at that time was a symbol of disgrace, and there's no way that a disingenuous person would command that his troops, who were not of that faith, bear this humiliating sign of the cross unless he higgs said it in chat pope saint damasus the first please pray for us absolutely pope saint damasus please pray for us absolutely my brother great that was a great comment higgs i love pope saint damasus he's actually one of my favorite popes of all time firmly believed it and
Constantine believed that. After Constantine became emperor, one of the first things that he did was to issue the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan officially ended the persecution of Christians. It made it legal for Christianity to exist. It's he who calls the First Ecumenical Council to settle the Arian controversy. We know that at the First Ecumenical Council, there was a lot of strong passions and feelings that came out about the person of Arius and about his teachings. And in response to what Arius was teaching, in order to correct it, the first part of the creed was written. And particularly when we say, and I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten. Uh, blissful friends said power chat not working. Um, try it, try it again. Hold up. I'll send it, I'll send it over to you. Should be working. I got it. I got working earlier. Someone, uh, someone, uh, said, said it's working, but sent it in. Hopefully it works. And son of God, begotten of the father before all ages, that this is exactly a response to what Arius had been saying, that there was a time when he was not. The church is saying, no, he was begotten. He existed before all ages. So the creed in... The duck said, you know what? I'm getting a goat too. Let's go, dude. Goat? That's awesome, man. That's so sick. I Goats are goats are so cute, man. I love goats. Um, I, I used to know this farmer and he had goats for a while. And it was, it was so fun to just like get, give them like, get, just pet them and stuff like that. But man, they love to headbutt if you're not careful, man. Those words is specifically directed at the wrong teachings of Arians. So with all of this was resolved, the pronouncement was made to condemn the teachings of Arius and to preserve the orthodoxy of the true church. And although Constantine, uh, Emperor Constantine was bringing peace and harmony to the Christian church, it's not as if his empire was made up of predominantly- Oh, Marion Bro sent, sent $5. Thank you, brother. Um, that's probably blissful. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the stream. How's uh, Secret of the Rosary going? Life-changing book. Can't wait to read it again. It's it's a fantastic book. I mean, it's just led to me appreciating the Rosary that much more. You know what I mean? Like I, I read it and it and and, and and I realize that it's like every Hail Mary you say, every Our Father, every Glory Be, is not in vain. You know, it, every single prayer of the Rosary has this deep meaning to it. And I think that sometimes when we say the rosary, we, we do it, you know, we do it devoutly and, and, and we do it with intention, but we don't understand why we're praying the rosary. And I, and, and I love that that book really gets to the heart of like, why do we pray the rosary? Why is the rosary such a, a special devotion? So I've loved it, man. Glory be to God, bro. History and theology, uh, enthusiast said, uh, what's up, bro? How's it going, hey, homie? Um, Prot slander Constantine saying he was selfish and this was about himself and he used the church to serve himself, shaking my head. Um, sorry, my buddy was calling me. Um, yeah, dude, that's very true. They do, they do slander the church a lot. Um, and, 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 and say that, uh, you know, he was just trying to, trying to be like selfish or, or something like that. That's not true in the slightest. I mean, you know, if he was trying to be selfish, he would have tried to direct the council in his, uh, someone was calling me Mohican, uh, Mohique, and that's why you heard, um, my, my, uh, one of my best friends was trying to call me. I'll call him after the stream. Um, yeah, he, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, if he was trying to be selfish, there's a hundred other things he could have done to make it much easier to try and control the church. But upholding Nicene orthodoxy, upholding the orthodoxy of Nicaea was not one of them by any means. Uh, that, that was a hard position to be in. Christians, it's not as if he himself had been baptized, had been motivated, saw himself as a, a being born in Christ, uh, uh, being a Christian himself. His first coins, in fact, are still minted with the inscription Sol Invictus the unconquerable sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N, not yet. He's not quite to that point yet. I think the reason why Constantine did not become a Christian after the battle, even after the vision, 
is, is the same reason that many people to this day won't fully commit their lives to Christ. Even people in the church, let alone outside the church. And that's because they don't know what will happen. With Constantine as a Caesar, he could plan his life. It was predictable. He had control over it. He had a lot of say in what would happen in his life and what it would look like. But if he gave his life to Christ, all bets are off. He wouldn't know what would happen. And same thing today with so many people. They don't give their life to Christ because they want to be in command. They want to be able to call the shots. And if they give their life to Christ, they don't know what will happen or what direction they'll go. And they're right. Much like he didn't want to anger the gods at one point, at this point he doesn't want to anger the God who helped him win the battle, the God who gave him the sign. And yet it was not so much that he, he respected or wanted to embrace Christianity at the time as it was a fear of losing power. Therefore, Constantine acted and carried out his duties just like his predecessors. And unfortunately, even though he was the freer of the Christians, and even though he was calling the First Ecumenical Council to help Christianity get their act together, he was still killing emperors and their families as they popped up trying to take some of his power away. It was a dual nature, and yet it was understandable because Constantine was just a product of his society. Constantine presents truly a human enigma, and um, to me even personally. I mean, here's a man who would conquer, and not just simply conquer and come in to his territory as king, as emperor, uh, but someone who would not only discredit his former enemy, the emperor, but have him killed, and have his entire family killed. And then, at the same time, do what he could to raise the ethical premium of that Tory territory for example i just have to say how does how does someone not look at the colossus colossus of saint constantine or like the statues of like especially like the catholic roman emperors and just not feel inspired you know what i mean like like there's something like so inspiring about seeing like saint constantine's statue and being like yeah like that's someone who like loved christ with all their heart and oh this is a man who loved christ with all his heart and did so much so much for our Lord Jesus Christ when, you know, he had the possession of an entire empire, right? And, you know, I, I mean, people can mock the position he was in politically, but it's like, you weren't there, bro. Like, you weren't there. You weren't having to deal with the kind of rivalries and the kind of treachery and stuff like that that took, that it takes to run an entire empire. And I'm just, like, inspired when I see, like, you know, his his statue, right? And, and understanding that it's like, even... A statue as grand as that, like he humbled himself before the true king, the true emperor of all of humanity, of all of our world, Jesus Christ, of all the universe, our Lord Jesus Christ. And like that, that's very awe-inspiring to see, you know what I mean? Jordan Jones said, how to be, how to perfectly defend Mary's sinlessness in the Bible by divine mercy apologetics, dude, bodies, the anti-Mary debate. That's awesome, dude. I would love to see that. No, no. Uh, Nola uh, Nola Rock Studio said, "How's it going? Love your memes. Hey, dude, thank you. I appreciate that." Crowboy, hello, good to see you, dude. Uh, the lives of slaves became better. Uh, he took into account the needs of impoverished children. What do you make of a man like that? Around this time, Crispus now has been his lieutenant, his Caesar, for ten years. So Saint Constantine decides to have a celebration in Rome for the occasion of the 10th anniversary of Christmas's reign. The whole family's on the way to Rome. They're together. One of the few times they're probably all together as a family. And as is the unfortunate case with many dysfunctional families, <laughs> problems arise. <laughs> and this one was a big one. St. Constantine's wife, Fausta, had two sons by Constantine. And upon arriving in Rome and seeing the power of Crispus, she knew that one day Crispus would indeed ascend the throne. Fausta, the wife of Constantine, accuses Crispus, 31 years old, Fausta is 35 years old, of uh, trying to seduce her. And Fausta makes this known to Constantine, and Constantine throws his son, Crispus, into jail. Before St. Constantine is able to have Crispus interrogated, Fausta, with some co-conspirators, has the execution, the imperial execution papers forged, sealed and Crispus is executed. 
Constantine was not a stupid individual. Constantine read what was happening, had his wife executed in a very, very brutal way. She is placed in a bathtub of scalding water. So not only does he have her killed, but basically tortured. It's a horrible death. So here's a man again, you know, surrounding himself with events of intrigue that lead to bloodshed and death. Was this terrible? Absolutely. But not any more terrible than the rest of the emperors. But God still used him because Christianity is in the business and God is in the business of reclaiming people that are lost, of turning around hopeless situations. In my heart of hearts, I think by this time, Constantine was a tortured man. On the one hand, he was coming to terms with some of the insights that he was given by his mother, by the witness of the Christians themselves, and yet he, he felt compelled by this urge for power, um, and yet he couldn't come to terms with both. And at that point, he moved the empire. This was not a Band-Aid fix. This was a major fix. Constantine at this point would move the capital from Rome the city of Jesus, and later rename it after himself, uh, Constantinople, uh, St. Helen would do the opposite. She would go to Jerusalem and at this point begin her search for the holy relics. And during this period of time, with, of course, St. Constantine's help, St. Helen visits many, many of these holy sites and places, finds many... Um, if Prots want to know why God used Constantine, they should read the book of Judges. Very true, brother. Uh, very true. I mean, God God uses rulers to exact his judgment and stuff like that. We read about that in the New Testament, too, especially Romans, right? Um, the way that God uses, you know, rulers and stuff like that to exact his judgment. Um, NBA King says, the Bible truly is a story of many broken people. That's what's missed by, uh, by those uh, who reject. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it always goes back to, you know, people always say like, oh, I know this Catholic who did this or I know this Catholic who did that. And, and you know, rather than saying, oh, no, 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 that that's wrong. It's like, yes, like, you know, someone who's a sinner, you know, someone who is in need of God's mercy and healing, who fell short. That's horrible that they fell short. I'm not condoning someone falling short. I shouldn't condone myself when I fall short. But to to, to look at that person who sins and say, you know, that's why God isn't real. That's why his church, you know, the Catholic church isn't the church. It's actually the opposite. It's like the Catholic church is the church, the true church of Jesus Christ, precisely because it is a hospital for sinners. It is a place where broken people are mended anew by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it's not a sign of contradicting the church. It's rather a sign that this is the church. This is the hospital for sinners and that sinners need in order to achieve and receive that that life giving salvation, that life giving healing. You know what I mean? Nolarak Studios said, as a former oneness Pentecostal, I um, whose view of history was just stolen from the Baptists. It's always learning to. Uh, it's always interesting to learn about who Constantine actually was. Absolutely, because you see, you don't see this man who's just trying to dominate uh, Christianity or who made the Catholic Church. You know, ridiculous, right? You see someone who's this tortured soul, this this saint with this tortured soul, who's trying to love Jesus Christ and at the same time di navigate a difficult political situation. And and I think like the end of his life shows that he chose God above all else, as imperfect as he was. You know what I mean? I know this Catholic who fed the poor, therefore it is the true church. That's so true, dude. Relics and builds churches, but perhaps. One of her greatest finds, if you will, is the cross of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. From that point on, the next 11 years of his reign became a reign of peace, a reign of prosperity, of economic growth, of power within the world through trade, through commerce, and most important, through religion, through spirituality. At this point in his life, Constantine begins to have a series of mild heart attacks. As he saw the end of his life, he approached a priest and asked to be baptized. He wants to go, at that point, to be baptized in the Jordan River. He doesn't make it. He gets as far as Helenopolis, oddly enough, the city that he named after his mother. And he's baptized, and he takes off the purple robes of royalty. 
and he puts on the white robe of a neophyte, of someone who's newly baptized. They say that from the time that he was baptized, he never took off his, never wore anything other than his baptismal garment. He did not wear the imperial clothing anymore. He was absorbed in being Christian and being a follower of Christ. And that was more important to him than anything else. I think that his conversion and his baptism were most sincere. And if he recovered from his illness, it is written that he stated he would no longer wear the imperial purple. And it's as a neophyte, as someone newly baptized, as someone who is fortis manos, newly enlightened, newly illumined, that's how Constantine dies. That's how he goes to meet his maker. He was baptized and accepted Christ, and Christ accepted him and forgave him and renewed him and made him a saint. And that's the story of Constantine. It was that small moment that brought glory as opposed to many years that may not have been so glorious. But it was that moment. It was the thief on the cross who stole paradise because Jesus looked at the thief who committed many sins, much like Constantine, and said, from this moment, because the thief acknowledged him as Lord, from this moment you shall be with me in paradise. Perhaps Jesus looked down at Constantine and saw that life and as he entered the baptismal waters of that font in his own empire at the hands of his own priest and when he accepted Christ maybe it was Christ who said at this hour Constantine you shall be with me in heaven and he is in heaven and he is a saint and that's why we remember him today how do we define a saint? is a saint someone who's a holy person all their lives? if that's how we define a saint then really there are very, very few saints. If a saint is somebody who was going a certain way and then changed their life and was touched by Christ and did great things with the position that they had because of Christ, if that's a saint, then he should be a saint. We fall and we rise, we fall and we rise. Constantine was no different. There's no exception to that. Once again in church history, it is the peasant it is the meaningless individual in society that is the gateway and the vehicle of greatness and of change and of salvation. They call this the scandal of selection, that somehow God picks individuals by his time, by his plan, that we can't always know why he chose the particular persons he did and when he chose them to to function. I think that this was just after 300 years that the time was right, that Christianity had stewed under persecution for so long, and when it was going to be time for it to come out, it was going to erupt and blossom something beautiful. A thought comes to mind with, you know, Jesus Christos Nikah and, and, and Jesus Christ Conquer. I reflect on Constantine, and I think, you know, obviously that was a sign he saw in the sky that he put on the shields that brought him the glory of his empire. But I I think of it as for himself personally, because here was a man who all his life struggled for power, struggled for supreme power, and did many things that were horrific. And yet at his deathbed, he says, I've always thirsted for this to be baptized, and I, I would give my my empire away, I would be a, a repentant peasant if I could grasp this. And I think that in Jesus Christ conquer, I think it was for him to conquer himself, conquer his own struggles, conquer his own demons to finally find Christ. And so maybe that's a different way of looking at it, that he needed to conquer his own destiny and to see for himself who truly Christ was, the King of glory. That is an incredible biography. I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed watching that all the way through. I mean, you know, here you have this man who's so tortured by the demands of being like a political leader and 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 you know what comes what comes with being a political leader you know what i mean and yet the most important thing to him is his baptism is his faith you know it, it reminds me of, a, of another roman emperor that saint saint augustine would write on 
And he said, St. Augustine wrote about St. Theodosius the Great. He said, St. Theodosius the Great cared so much about being Christian that he would be that he considered his membership in the Catholic Church to be more precious to him than being emperor of the Roman Empire. Those are saints. Those men who look and they say, I would give all this up. I would give up the world to follow Christ. That is a saint. So I'm so honored to to listen to the beautiful biography of St. Constantine the Great. That is beautiful. And I, I, I will... I will probably be buying an icon of him soon actually after that. That really that really touched a deep part of my heart quite frankly and I hope you guys feel the same too. Um we need to watch more saint biographies like this. Um I wonder if there's one on Saint Andre, uh, Andrew Wooters to be honest. Hmm. I'm curious. I'll have to I'll have to look it up. Um let's see here. I remember there's one saint who was an opium addict for most of his life, even until his death, but he died a martyr. God can use a brutal emperor or a drug addict. Truly amazing. Well, that uh that saint, Saint Mark G uh T Zhang Saint Mark uh T Zhang and he was martyred I believe in the Boxer Rebellion and yet he there's a statue made of him uh you know showing the effects of of his addiction to opium or what have you but he he you know lived his life willing to be martyred during the Boxer Rebellion because he he wouldn't give up his faith I mean he he's such a such a holy man of God. Such a holy man of God, bro. I, I I'm I'm blown away by his sacrifice. I mean, it's sad because he he would keep going to confession, but he wouldn't be absolved, right? Because uh, you know, he he uh couldn't overcome his addiction, yet he he still kept pursuing God. You know, he he still kept pursuing God despite all of that. What a beautiful man. You're truly lucky to, you know, know this wonderful saint of God. The martyrs of China. Um, Enthusiastus said, In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Ephesians 1.7 very true brother w's in chat i love to see it man um i remember there's one saint who was an opium oh yes i just read that yeah it it is beautiful saint mark uh g uh tian jang um in him or ugh, i just read that comment goodness i'm i'm rereading comments tonight guys i'm losing my mind nba king had a great comment to say that i just read here I hate to tie it back, but I really think Ye had the opportunity to become a saint if he had stayed committed and Nick inspired him to become Catholic. I pray he breaks out of the hands of the devil. I pray too. I, I, I pray he does too. But he, he is, it is clear that he currently is choosing, choosing not God, but choosing the devil as his master. You don't get to say that you are, you, you are, are the new Jesus. That is absolutely blasphemous to say that you're the new jesus there, there there is nothing more evil and wicked than that you, you are not the new jesus jesus christ is not like you cannot even put yourself in the same realm as our lord and savior jesus christ how dare you it was sickening that he even thought he could say that and i pray that he repents i also pray to be martyred um the duck said about saint saint mark uh uh saint mark g i believe so yeah and patrick ripper's right getting denied absolution is the worst thing ever i mean I, you know it's heart heartbreaking when something like that happens but it's important too because we do need to be sorrowful for our sins and we do need to have a firm purpose of amendment to our lives um telos bra asked pines have any dips with or tips 
dips, tips dealing with scrupulosity. I would say um, the uh, the scruple, uh, scruples and sainthood is a fantastic book. Scruples and sainthood, as well as uh, understanding scrupulosity, um, is is a fantastic book. Um, it will really really help you understand uh, what 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 plan God has for your life. And I think St. Alphonsus Liguori is a fantastic saint uh, to ask for his intercession for scrupulosity. What I can tell you off, off the, off the cuff though, outside of recommending book, uh, recommending books is you have to remember that Jesus loves you. Jesus isn't looking for your eternal damnation. Jesus isn't looking to not save you from your sins. Jesus isn't looking to condemn you to hell. Jesus says in the gospels, you know, I have come to save the world, not condemn it. Right. And Jesus is looking to save you. You aren't stricken from that. He wouldn't suffer everything that he suffered on the cross. He wouldn't suffer all the humiliation, the spite, the hatred, everything that even we have shown him that I have shown him that all of us have shown him if he didn't love you and he loves you very much. And no matter when you fall in your life, when you make mistakes, you have to remember that Jesus doesn't look at your fall or your falling into sin or anything like that with eyes of hate. It's with eyes of love and he wants you to get back up and know that you are his beloved child, that he loves you so much that he would go through everything, every torture, every punishment, every affliction over again just to redeem you. And that's my biggest advice I would give for you. Never forget that Jesus Christ loves you and that you can always come back to him. You are not beyond redemption. I'm not beyond redemption. Anyone is not beyond redemption. Patrick Roiper asks, what are my plans for Lent? Um, I think praying daily is is huge. Um, I, I want to be better about, about fasting too. I'm trying to do black black fasts every single day. It's been, or oh, not every single day, my goodness, every single Friday. Uh, I haven't been perfect at that. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of start small and uh, uh, do things like, you know, no meat, uh, being better about no meat, then after no meat, one meal, and then fully black fast, uh, no sugar. I'm trying to do no sugar and, uh, trying to limit social media. Um, those are my main plans. I would say to one of the saints, he said, he, uh, he could open the gates of hell to show, uh, but he wants people to worship him in love, not fear. Absolutely. He said that to St. Brid Our Lord Jesus Christ said that to St. Bridget of Sweden. I think Trent Horn and James White are debating live right now, if I'm not mistaken. Hope Trent does well. That's awesome, dude. I'll have to I'll have to watch that. In fact, I'll probably end the live here so you guys can go watch that. Um That being said, once we know we must fear God, but that we must um but yeah, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it's in order so that we can turn away from our sins. It is good to fear God in order that we may stop sinning, but not so much so that you then um that you then then don't love God with all your heart. You know what I mean? Um because God wants us to love him and serve him out of love. But still fear, but love firstly. Yes. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Philippians 4 eight. Absolutely, brother. I've never seen James White debate well against the Catholic. Me neither. <laughs> no, he gets he gets cooked and then he like copes after and he'll he'll recycle a lot of like old Protestant lies about like Vatican one or whatever to try and like get his followers to cope about why they're not Catholic, but it just doesn't work. Um, there would be some saints um, that would only have the Eucharist. Yes, that's very true. Um, there were saints that only ate the Eucharist and subsisted off the Eucharist, um, and and they lived beautiful lives, you know. The the way Nick put it, tr as trembling uh, before the knowledge of the sacrifice of Calvary, seeing the crucifixion, absolutely. Well, and um, that that's just very wise words. I would say it, it's it's all about understanding that God has done all these things because he's loved us so much. And he's he's calling us to this renewed life with him and this renewed relationship. And it's like, there can only be glory and beauty in that. You know what I mean? Also, this is a beautiful icon. I definitely want to see about getting 
getting this icon. I'm I'm trying to think what a small icon would be. Um, minimum of three. Yeah, small icon of Saint Constantine the Great would be awesome. Do I like old Roman chant? Yes, I sure do. I was listening. I I have some added to my uh, prayer playlist on uh, Spotify that I really 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 like a lot. Always gets me. I think one was VD Aquam, uh, if I'm remembering the Latin name correctly. That was a beautiful chant. But I think, guys, this is a good stopping point. Um, I've been streaming for, so I've been streaming for a long time now. I think this is a good stopping point, especially so you guys can go watch the Trent Horn, uh, James White debate. Go check that debate out. I, I'm definitely going to check that out too. But guys, thank you for thank you for just uh, enjoying enjoying this with me and i'm so luck i'm so lucky that we got to just enjoy this time together and be expecting more streams and stuff like that so god bless you guys i will speak to you later and always keep the faith always keep the catholic faith